Yeah, you're getting okay. feedback. Okay, I can start. Hello, are people on Zoom able to hear us in the room? If you can hear us, yes. let us know. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch the batteries. Just let yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, switch. Uh, are people on Zoom able to hear us? Hang on. They said yes. They said yes. Yeah, and you can minimize that afterwards. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why you just uh, uh, send them, okay? Ask them to log in. Can you check like in on the WhatsApp? Did everyone started using the new? No, 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 message type them that like, you know, make sure otherwise people might be still logged into the old one. That's correct, Rajaji. Still people might be still logged in with the previous one, Gauruji sent. They have to log it out, log out and use this new latest link I sent. I think that one also works actually. No, that's not working. That is the administrative login. If you log in that, if you use that one, what it will say is like, there is another meeting in progress. Okay. Okay. Do you, know, um, do you know if Zoom records the audio? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know where it records it to? Uh, it's already like, and it just puts in the cloud. Do you, know, do you know where to access that? Uh, Gauruji has that. Why? Right? Okay. Because there's, okay. There's no audio for the microphone. Oh, what happened? In, in the camera, because we've set it up for the Zoom. Oh, okay. so I mean, I said the same So you need the batteries. So do you want to use? If there's a problem, I'll I'll just get behind that. If there's a problem, use these batteries, and I'll just get behind that. Okay. How many people logged in? Well, if you need something to huh? record and you're unable to, I will relinquish this and go behind the podium. Let me try. Let me see if this. Works. Rajuji, how many people are on Zoom? You can see, go to. Okay. Why don't you check it out? Hey, would you mind staying with right there? You can, you can wear this though. That's totally fine. I don't know. Are you going to be the one speaking the whole time? Uh, I'm going to be doing one and a half. And someone else is going to come in too. Is going to do so you can take it off after you're done. Yeah. Because if you're going to be the one talking, it's totally okay. Because you can wear it. Okay. I'll just I'll take this. I will pass this to whoever's. Yeah. That sounds okay. good. Whoever's talking, I can pass this. Okay. Sounds good. In fact, we can use this when he starts to. Mm -hmm. I just said. Do you want me to? Um, you want me to hook this up to the speakers or no? Well, I'm going to be up there. Uh -huh. So whatever it is you need to do. So people can Zoom can hear and the, it can be recorded. Well, I mean, if, if you're going to stand here though, then they'll hear you for sure. Yeah. No, I'm saying if you if you need me to relinquish this and stand here, I'll do that. Okay, so yeah. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah, let's do that. Right. So, this. Okay. so can we start? So there are 12 parts spent already. Okay. Someone say you're being rolled up. Yeah.
So I will start. So Namaste everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, we'll start our session with the opening prayer. Please sit in uh, uh, erect position. Okay. Feet on the ground or cross-legged fine. Uh, close your eyes. Roll your shoulders and open the chest. Bring your both hands to the heart center. Both palms touching each other. Observe your breath. Let chant the ohms followed by peace chant Sahana Vautu. Take a deep inhale. Oh. Take a deep inhale. Oh. Inhale and start the prayer. Inhale. Oh. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadita Mastu Mavid Vishavahai Om Shanti 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 Thank you. Um, welcome again. Uh, sorry, we had some technical issues. We are starting the session a few minutes uh, late. And we have uh, Mukunji and uh, uh, Rita Ji going to present on aging. And we have three sessions. Each session is 55 minutes. And uh, we will have Mukunji starts the first session with uh, what is a healthy aging. And then uh, he's going to present the cognitive vitality and uh, dementia, dementia. Then we'll take a break followed by fundamentals of elder care and uh, uh, geriatrics. And uh, then we'll have question and answer session followed by homework um, assignments and uh, closing prayer. Okay. So again, um, we saw the profile and uh, this is the same thing as uh, how we saw in the previous sessions. And uh, yeah, and okay, we all know Mukunji like asked me to not to read about any of uh, his details of the prof profile, but we know Mukunji, like, you know, he's uh, our board member as well as the uh, faculty. So he has a big list. Actually, I, I had trouble in editing his profile to put on um, and the, this one. Okay, so again, it's for your reference. He has like, you know, so many things he achieved. So Mukunji, please. Uh, and uh, he's go also going to introduce uh, Rita Ji, okay. Uh, yeah, so the first one is we are going to see aging. Um, objectives of aging is 100. Uh, so the course objectives are provide a clear understanding of healthy aging and how it will, how to achieve it. The second one is motivate scholars to reflect on how you, how you, how they can apply this knowledge in the context of their own life, the lives of the, their loved ones, and the potentially their communities, services, service activities. Third one is encourage, motivate, and facilitate scholars to become ambassadors for the healthy aging. So with that, uh, I am uh, welcoming Mukunji to do the first uh, presentation. And we'll actually cover the objectives in the presentation. Yeah. So yeah. we can admit our work. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mukunji. So Krishnaji, thank you. And uh, I'm again glad to be uh, here talking to you all again. Um, before I go ahead, does, can people on Zoom hear me, hear what I have to say? Yes. Yes. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, when my uh, uh, colleague today, uh, Dr. Rita Ghatak. Rita Ji is going to be here a little bit later. She had uh, some personal issues come up and 
so she could not join at the outside, but she is going to be joining us and you will hear from us. And when she is here, uh, I will introduce you to her. So, and, and you, of course, you will get to hear her this evening. Uh, but before I start with, with uh, uh, the courses on aging today, I'd like to kind of step back just for a second and give you a, uh, so a context for what today's session means uh, relative to your whole program. So think of the service learning module, uh, model uh, that we, we developed for you. Right? So if you remember, uh, there was a pyramid uh, that was a symbol of our service learning. Uh, the base of the pyramid, the very foundation of, that, of, of, of this whole course is the Hindu tradition and wisdom that you're learning, which is an essential and key part of this entire course, right? And you had several le uh, lectures already in, in that context. Built on that foundation of Hindu wisdom and traditions is a set of essential skills and knowledge that sets essential skills that you need in order to be effective as community service people, right? So uh, uh, I had a lecture uh, earlier in, in the semester about being a compassionate presence. That was one of them. Uh, you heard, I believe, last week from Puneet Ji, you, you've been talking about a uh, little bit about positive psychology, I, 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 if I remember correctly. Uh, some, you'll have, through, at, by the end of this course, you'll, you'll have information on uh, counseling skills, on case management, on ethics, on privacy, those kinds of things, which are all essential details that you need to know if you're going to go out as a representative of an organization and do a good job of representing yourself as well as the organization in the community. So, so you have Hindu, Hindu wisdom and, and, and uh, tradition, you have essential skills for counseling, for, for community service. Built on top of that is a third piece of which today's lecture is part, and that is the knowledge that you need in order to be effective in the areas that you want to, um, to, to provide support in, right? And if you're going to go out and deal with, with older people, what you have going to hear today and some of the other lectures that are forthcoming are essential in doing that. So we're going to give you enough knowledge about the fundamentals of aging which help you understand the key issues and also which, which will help you know where to look to find more information when you need it. And then on top of that, the very peak of the, 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 this model that we have of learning is your own practical experience. Right? And as you build your practical experience, you'll feed back that back into the learning model. So, it's a learn, serve, learn, continuous improvement model that we have. So um, we're going to have three lectures on aging today. One is the first one I'm going to st start on, on now, which is what is healthy aging. Uh, once that's done, uh, Dr. Rita Ghatak, Rita Ji is going to talk to you about uh, uh, cognitive vitality and dementia. Um, I'll tell you more about her background and expertise in this area. And then, uh, as uh, Krishna ji mentioned after the break, both Rita ji and I will uh, uh, combine to talk to you about the third uh, lecture in the series, which is about fundamentals of geriatrics and elder care. And at the end of the ses session, you should have a good feeling about what it, what it means to get old, right? And what it means to help other people as they get old and what you can do about it. So, what is healthy aging? So let's start with that. The course objectives uh, are to understand what we mean by healthy aging, right? Then take that knowledge and reflect on it. We want you to be able to not just leave this lecture satisfied with what you've heard, but we want you to think about it, what it means to you, what it means to you in the context of your own life, because Nothing we do here is theoretical. Everything we do here has a practical application. Right? So what does it mean to me? How can I apply this 
should be the question you need to ask after every single lecture you hear here. And if you cannot answer the question, how do I apply it, then you have not learned the material well, or we have not taught the material well to you, either way, right? And if you, at any point, and I've told you guys this before, at any point, if you find myself, find yourself leaving the lecture saying, what did this mean? How do I apply it? And you don't know, come back and talk to us, ask us that. You, know, you, you have to be uh, proactive in that direction. You also need to understand how, the, how are you gonna apply this in the context of your family and friends, your loved ones. Right? And if you are going to go into community service, and I think the main reason you're here attending this course is to get certif a certification to go into service for others, you need to understand how to apply this for that as well. And the last one is my personal pitch to you. Once you're convinced about healthy aging, you need to go out and spread the message to others on healthy aging. Right? Okay, so let's begin with, and by the way, um, I know uh, Krishnaji said we'll reserve all question answers to the end, but if you have a question that you feel you need to ask, do interrupt me and ask them as we go along. Interactive sessions are fine. I, what's the worst I'm gonna say? I'm not gonna answer your question now, hold it, right? <laughs> all right, so, welcome. I want to start with a story before I get to that. I want to start with, with a story about Brill Cream. Now, Brill Cream is something that uh, the British first uh, put on the market back in 1928, right? Probably before many of us in this room here were born, right? And as a young, dashing, nine-year-old, I made a case to my parents saying, I absolutely needed to have Brill Cream because I needed to get that hairstyle exactly right like Devanand, right? And go out and make sure that I could use that look to bring in all the young ladies that he apparently had so much success doing. So my father, uh, who was a tremendous father, he listened to me, then went into his library of books, pulled out a swill, slim volume, opened up the book, and showed me a poem, okay? And I have never forgotten the poem. Uh, here it is, it says, newborn babies have no hair, old men's heads are equally bare, from the cradle to the grave, lies but a haircut and a shave. Right. Now, it's a funny poem. I laughed at it. I thought about it, I've never forgotten it. If you look at it, you can, we can spend a whole hour debating what this poem means. It, it is a commentary on life. Maybe it's a commentary on the futility of life. Maybe it is a commentary on the finiteness of life, right? the inevitability of life, but you can look at it in different ways. But I'm just going to say, hair is important in life. If I, so we, we can, I said, have a whole discussion. But the thing that I want to bring to you in, term, in the context of this poem today is it also talks about aging. If you look at it, from the moment you're born to the moment you die, things happen. But what is happening from the moment you're born to the moment you die? Every second, inexorably, we are aging. Right? So let me talk about aging. And again, you can see in the context of hair, hair uh, whether we are in our father's or mother's hands, or we are dashing youngsters trying to impress all the people of the opposite sex, or when we get old and realize that all of our efforts were probably not successful. And then we come to the realization that maybe there are other ways to impress people of the opposite sex, right? We definitely needed to Absolutely. <laughs> hey, that is, as you're assuming these photographs are mine. <laughs> 
So, and by the way, I, at one point I had hair as long as you did. So. Um, but aging, the point I want to make, is not an event. It's a continuous process. It does not stop. Whether you're aware of it or not, it does not stop, right? And most of the time, we're not aware about it. We don't pay attention to it until one day we turn around or look in the mirror or look at a picture or something and say, my, 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 what happened? Where did all that time go, right? Time, who, who what's that, uh, there's a quote? That time and tide waits for no man, right? Or woman for that matter. So it can creep up and sometimes it can be a disruptive creeping. Right? And so what we wanna talk to tell you about is we want to figure out how to grasp aging in our hands. We want to figure out how we can take control of it. Right? And that's the topic of, essentially the topic of, of this first lecture. One of the things I want to point to you, by the way, is we, we have three lectures today and you'll find that they interactively address the same themes. You'll find that they're not all compartmentalized. They each keep touching on what each other said. Which is, which is a good thing because they, they're connected in a way, right? So I'm going to start by what is healthy aging, right? A definition. And the, this definition I'm going to give you is from the World Health Organization, which is a reputable body. Um, is there a way to move these things off of so yeah. people can read this slide? Can you come and help me with this, please? Either remove it from the screen or, because it's, or minimize it in some way. Just, to, just move it up to the top corner of bottom. Thank you, sir. So healthy aging, according to the World Health Organization, is about creating the environments and opportunities that enable people to be and do what they value through their lives. If you look at this definition for a minute, it's nothing to do, it doesn't say anything but aging but it's very critical and central to aging. This is a sociological policy, system, systematic or systemic definition of aging, right? So it's not aging, remember, it's healthy aging. Healthy aging should, if it's done right, do what, what is said in bold, create environments and opportunities that en enable people to do what they value throughout their lives, okay? Further, it's not advancing. Okay, it was on. So the next is a, 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 a continuing statement Everybody can experience healthy aging. And now you notice the difference in the spelling of aging. This is the correct British way. Um, being free of disease or infirmity is not a requirement for healthy aging. As many older adults have one or more health conditions that when well controlled, have little influence on their well-being. You can be old, you can have multiple health issues, but you can be well. Right? So here is another expansion of what we mean by healthy aging. Now we come to what the World Health Organization tells us that we as a society should look at healthy aging and our goal for healthy aging should be to develop and maintain functional ability that enables well-being in older age. We cannot prevent getting old, right? we can, if we are lucky, we can minimize the health issues that we have. We cannot be quote unquote 100% healthy. Little ailments, little bit, you know, you know, keep happening, right? But what healthy aging implies is regardless of the fact that we're getting old, regardless of the fact that we may be dealing with health issues, right? We want to maintain the best functional ability, and we'll talk more about this, that enables well-being in older age. Keep this definition in mind. 
We'll come back and see how to make it actionable very shortly. So this is the World Health Organization telling us this. Now, how many of you have looked around well, some days and say, I feel older today than I did the other day? Has anyone ever felt that? I probably felt that when I was 15, right? How many of you have looked around and said, you know, Krishnaji looks much younger than he is or somebody else? Have you, had, had, have you looked at somebody and said, boy, this, I didn't expect this person to be so old, so, right? Have you had that impression, right? And the opposite person, boy, is, is, is that how young this person is? He or she feels or behaves or looks much older. You had that impression too, right? So what, is, what are we saying? What we're talking about is a difference between your chronological age and your biological age. Right? And there's a lot of research going on in this. When we say our biological age, it's not how many years ago you were born, you know, 72 years and 25 days ago, right? It's a measure of your physiological state, your actual well being. That is your biological age. And there's a doctor of uh, behavioral sciences and nutrition who says that many things we as a society attribute to age are not at all anything to do with age. It's more related to our activity or our inactivity. If I sit around on a couch all day, pretty soon I won't be able to use my legs to walk. Right? A professor, so he's looking at it, the first one, is a quote from a professor of nutrition and, and behavioral sciences. The next one is a quote from a cell biologist. And she is saying that I can look at this at a biological cellular level and tell you that age-related changes, while we cannot delay them, you know, they're inevit inevitable, we can mitigate them, we can control them, we can, we can improve on things by certain things. And she suggests that a few of those are sleep, exercise, nutrition, stress reduction. We'll talk more about these, right? So the point to make here is that chronological and biological age are different things. And ultimately you are what you feel. You are what you do. Right? And so who has control about that? You, right? So now I'm going to take that definition that, uh, the World Health Organization gave and reframe that so it gets a little more actionable, a little more understanding as to what we can do ourselves. And this is a definition from health, helpguide.org. Whether you'll have access, I believe, to all these slides later on. So um, you can go back and review these and look at the, uh, and I have references at the end as well, so you can just check it out. But now with this, what, what they're saying here, and this is the definition that I'm going to work on and expand, healthy aging is more than about staying just physically healthy. It's about staying emotionally healthy and maintaining your sense of purpose and zest for life. I've heard people say, oh, I have nothing more to live for. And they were in the 40s, right? Um, how you behave, how you age depends on a lot on what's going on up in, the, in that brain of ours, right? As long as you have a sense of purpose, as long as you have a reason to live, your biology will help you promote that reason to live. So this is a very important thing for you to remember as well. These are all very, very practical constructs that I'm, I'm, I'm providing you. Not much of this new information is new. You haven't walked into this room and saying, oh boy, I've never heard about this before. It's just pulling stuff together in a way that makes sense. So when we say maintaining an emotional zest for life, 
main, being physically healthy, the things that we have to work on are body, mind, soul, and our spirit. Right? So we have to pursue in, health, in the healthy, healthy aging construct, we have to pursue physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Yes. Uh, I didn't mean to separate them. Soul and spirit can be combined. Um, so you can talk about soul as Atman, right? You can talk about soul as something that temporarily resides in your body, but is forever there, even when you know, the, the physical being is not there, the soul survives. Soul can go and, you know, if, if you talk in terms of reincarnation, spirit is not so much, I'm not talking about a ghostly spirit or a soul. Spirit is, is that positive feeling set of emotions that you have. Yes. Right? You've heard people say this person is a very sp high spirited person. Right? That, yeah. And then you can talk about spirit also in the context of spirituality. Right? So you can use those uh, uh, definition, th those meanings in both ways. And these things are not all, you know, you can put in a box and, and tie a ribbon around it. They're all interactive and they all build in each other. Does it help answer your question? So you could talk about a positive mood. You can positive talk about an attitude. You can talk about a philosophical way to approaching things. You know, all of those things kind of add, add up together. Okay. So now I'm going to ask you the question. Is it a good idea to say, let's wait another five or 10 years, and then we'll start to begin working on healthy aging? I'm only 33 now, you know, I've got to worry. I've, I've got this job to do, I've got two kids to raise, I've got the BMW to buy, you know, healthy aging, yeah, tomorrow, day after, next year, you know, let me get these 10 things done first. Make sense? Yeah? Shall I wait, wait till I finish all of this and then worry about healthy aging? So when's a good time to bring And remember creating environments and opportunities for doing what you value. I use that phrase. That is from that World Health Organization, right? So when are you, when am I going to start creating my own en op environments and opportunities? When is a good time for me to do that, do you think? Now, yesterday, right? If I didn't do yesterday, I missed today doing it. Right? So the, the practical elements I'm going to start to build on now says you need, healthy aging is not something you do on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from two to four, right? Before you pick up the kids and after you do yoga or something like that. Right? You need to weave the goal of healthy aging into the fabric of your life. It should be everywhere. Integrate that into your daily routine. Okay? I'm making a pitch to you now. And when you become, you buy into my pitch and you become ambassadors of healthy aging, you are going to be making this pitch to others. Okay? So, I'm going to talk to you about doing a healthy aging mantra. I don't have a mantra for you. I'm just going to talk to you about doing it. You have to develop your own mantra. But, and I think I've talked to you about this before. Every morning when you get out, when you wake up, sit up at your bed. Before you get up, spend two minutes being grateful for something. Express gratitude. Do your gratitude thought, whatever it is. I am grateful for something that's going to happen today. I am grateful for something that happened yesterday. Right? After that, do your healthy aging mantra. And it says, I will try to do all that I must to maintain good physical health and a positive mental attitude. Have you ever felt getting out of bed? Uh, I don't think I want to get out of bed today. I think that yoga I was going to do, I might want to skip. Anyone ever had that feeling? Right? 
you have to talk to yourself. You have to urge yourself sometimes to, or if you could, kick yourself in the backside, right? If, if you have that flexibility, you're doing good yoga anyway. So. Um, right? And then it's not good enough to do this, to say that. What does this mean? It's very abstract, right? We went back to talking, earlier we talked about creating environments and opportunities to do things that you value, right? What I value are, may be different from what Shobhaji values or Rajuji values, right? So I need to figure out what it is that I value. What is it I want to do for which I need to stay healthy? So think of four things you want to do for your specific list. I want to be able to, when I'm 75 years old, right, walk more than two miles or at least 40 minutes at a pace that is faster than 18 minute mile. That's pretty specific, right? right? Rather than, oh, I think I, I want to go for a walk when I'm older. Right? And so add to your personal specific list. Like I said, I'm not going to fill this out for you. This is your job. Right? But you need to do that. If you can define at least a couple of things, and these things change with time, right? I want to be able to be functional enough to attend my granddaughter's college graduation. Right? So if my granddaughter is three years old, unless she's a very fast learner, I'm going to have to be healthy and positive for a while. Right? These, are all, th th these are all, how shall I put it, things that you want to do. Am I going to achieve 100% of what I want? Who knows, if I'm lucky, yes, maybe not. Right? We just talked about, uh, before you folks came in, um, Kobe Bryant, his helicopter ran into a hill and he's gone, right? We all don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow, but that shouldn't stop us from planning ahead, right? And being positive. So for this purpose, where do I start? Just a second, please. Um, Rita Ji is here and trying to find. Could you, uh, Krishna Ji, Rita Ji is looking for the place. Can you go look for you? You'll recognize her from the picture, yeah. right? Thank you, sir. Um, so, where do I start? Now, anyone who's been in, in a corporate environment or an organizational environment is likely to have heard of SMART goals. Are you all familiar with SMART goals? Some of you are, some of you aren't, right? So a SMART goal is something like I told you about uh, before. I want to be able to walk in uh, at least two miles or 40 minutes at, an, at a speed of better than 18 minute mile. So what is it? What is the specific thing I want to achieve, S, right? In my area of focus. It has to be meaningful to you or to the objective. Why is this goal important to you? It has to be action oriented. So it's going to define the steps that I'll take to achieve it, right? It has to be realistic. How do you know that you can achieve this goal, right? And then it has to be timely. I've got to do it at a certain, by a certain time. Oh, I'll do it isn't good enough. When are you gonna get there? So you have to develop these smart goals in a number of areas you for your own self have to identify all the factors that influence your health and well-being right figure out what those are they'll tell you what you need to work on do i need to lose 10 pounds do i need to control my blood pressure do i need to work on my cholesterol levels right? do i need to figure out how to stop eating a pint of ice cream every night <clears throat> you know Identify those. Then you gotta actually like a project, list the actions that you need to address those items, right? 
And then this is key, unless you enjoy doing it, unless something motivates you to do it, you are not going to do it. You make new resolutions and by the 15th of January you failed, right? If, you're, if you get that far. Uh, so you have to develop a plan that to incorporate these actions into pursuits that you enjoy. Right? You have to figure out, if I hate going to gym and getting on the treadmill, I'm not going to go, go to it. But if I like to go to the park and watch the birds and the flowers and so on, I could walk in the park as an example. Right? And then you have to make this all part of your daily routine. It's a process. It doesn't happen in a day. The other thing is start small. Don't take on huge chunks. Do something small. Once you've acquired a small habit and you make it into a habit, add a little bit to it. Add a little bit to it, right? Build on your success. Once you've done something, add to it. Please come in. And then if you enjoy it, you'll do it. Right? These are practical things, but these are the secrets to success in doing anything new, anything different. Now, we've talked about healthy aging. Now I'm going to throw a second term at you, and this is in the context of what uh, Puniji must have, could have, might have talked to you, positive psychology, right? Ritaji, welcome, there's a chair up here, please come. Um, so what is positive aging? It's a way of living rather than a state of being, right? You're not, you're not just being, you're actively living, you're actively doing things. Uh, it's the process of maintaining a positive attitude, right? Feeling good about yourself, keeping fit and healthy, and engaging fully as you age. That's key, right? And then there's, there's a third definition of aging. We talked about healthy aging, we talked about positive aging. Now we're talking about successful aging. Successful aging is in the sense that you're aging, you've made some contributions. Successful aging is multidimensional, encompassing the avoidance of disease and disability, the maintenance of high physical and cognitive function, and sustained engagement in social and productive act activities. That last sentence is the key driver. So part of healthy aging is to be positive, and part of positive aging is to be successful. Successful means doing things for yourself and others. That's key. Now, most of you heard about Jane Fonda. Um, some of us agree with what she's done, some not. She's lived a controversial life. She's done, uh, acted in many films. She's been, a, um, how shall I put it, uh, an activist in many, many different ways. But in this particular context, there's a, um, a short talk about 12 minutes that J, of, of Jane's that I'd like to share with you. I think it's extremely relevant to this topic. Um, it's addressed to women, but for the men in the audience, it's equally important that everything she says is relevant. And she talks about a model for life that, that uh, the ascension versus the arch that, that I can describe to you, right? I, or she will describe to you. And if I can get this video to play, Right. Otherwise, I guess it's. Uh, we need to go to a browser so I can pull it up. Okay. So okay. it's not working. It's about a thirteen-minute video or twelve-minute video. So let's get to a browser. I guess we didn't have time to pull it up before, right? So just let me just Google it for. So. Jane. 
So listen to her and we can talk afterward, after it's done. There have been many revolutions over the last century, but perhaps none as significant as the longevity revolution. We are living on average today 34 years longer than our great grandparents did. Think about that. That's an entire second adult lifetime that's been added to our lifespan. And yet, for the most part, our culture has not come to terms with what this means. We're still living with the old paradigm of age as an arch. That's the metaphor, the old metaphor. You're born, you peak at midlife, and decline into decrepitude. <laughs> age as pathology, but many people today, philosophers, artists, doctors, scientists, are taking a new look at what I call the third act, the last three decades of life. They realize that this is actually a developmental stage of life with its own significance as different from midlife as adolescence is from childhood. And they are asking, we, we should all be asking, how do we use this time? How do we live it successfully? What is the appropriate new metaphor for aging? I've spent the last year researching and writing about this subject, and I have come to find that a more appropriate metaphor for aging is a staircase, the upward ascension of the human spirit, bringing us into wisdom, wholeness, and authenticity. Age not at all as pathology, age as potential. And guess what? This potential is not for the lucky few. It turns out most people over 50 feel better, are less stressed, less hostile, less anxious. We tend to see commonalities more than differences, some of the studies even say we're happier. <laughs> this is not what I expected, trust me. I come from a long line of depressives. <laughs> As I was approaching my late 40s, when I would wake up in the morning, my first six thoughts would all be negative. And I got scared. I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to become a crotchety old lady. <laughs> but now that I am actually smack dab in the middle of my own third act, I realize I've never been happier. I have such a powerful feeling of well-being. And I've discovered that when you're inside oldness, as opposed to looking at it from the outside, fear subsides. You realize you're still yourself, maybe even more so. You know, Picasso once said, it takes a long time to become young. <laughs> I don't want to romanticize aging. Obviously, there's no guarantee that it can be a time of fruition and growth. Um, some of it is a matter of luck. Some of it obviously is genetic. One third of it, in fact, is genetic. And there isn't much we can do about that. But that means that two thirds of how well we do in the third act, we can do something about. We're gonna discuss what we can do to make these added years really successful and use them to make a difference. Now, let me say something about the staircase, which may seem like an odd, metaphor for seniors, given the fact that many seniors are challenged by stairs, <laughs> myself included. Um, as you may know, the entire world operates on a universal law, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy means that everything in the world, everything is in a state of decline and decay, the arch. There's only one exception to this universal law. And that is the human spirit, which can continue to evolve upward the staircase, bringing us into wholeness, authenticity, and wisdom. And here's an example of what I mean. This, this upward ascension can happen even in the face of extreme physical challenges. About three years ago, I read an article in the New York Times. Um, it was about a man named Neil Salinger, 57 years old, a retired lawyer, who had joined the writer's group at Sarah Lawrence, where he found his writer's voice. 
Two years later, he was diagnosed with ALS, commonly known as Gingeri's disease. It's a terrible disease. It's fatal. It wastes the body, but the mind remains intact. In this article, Mr. Selinger wrote the following to describe what was happening to him. And I quote, as my muscles weakened, my writing became stronger. As I slowly lost my speech, I gained my voice. As I diminished, I grew. As I lost so much, I finally started to find myself. Neil Selinger to me is the embodiment of mounting the staircase in his third act. Now we're all born with spirit, all of us, but sometimes it gets tapped down beneath the challenges of life, violence, abuse, neglect. Perhaps our parents suffered from depression. Perhaps they weren't able to love us beyond how we performed in the world. Um, perhaps we still suffer from a, a psychic pain, a wound. Perhaps we feel that many of our relationships have not had closure. And so we can feel unfinished. Perhaps the task of the third act is to finish up the task of finishing ourselves. For me, it began as I was approaching my third act, my 60th birthday. How was I supposed to live it? What was I supposed to accomplish in this final act? And I realized that in order to know where I was going, I had to know where I'd been. And so I went back and I studied my first two acts trying to see who I was then, who I really was, not who my parents or other people told me I was or treated me like I was, but who was I? Who were my parents? Not as parents, but as people. Who were my grandparents? How did they treat my parents? These kinds of things. I discovered a couple of years later that this process that I had gone through is called by psychologists doing a life review, and they say it can give new significance and clarity and meaning to a person's life. You may discover, as I did, that a lot of things that you used to think were your fault, a lot of things that you used to think about yourself, really had nothing to do with you. It wasn't your fault. You're just fine. And you're able to go back and forgive them and forgive yourself. You're able to free yourself from your past. You can work to change your relationship to your past. Now, while I was writing about this, I came upon a book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was a German psychiatrist who, who spent five years in a Nazi concentration camp. And he wrote that while he was in the camp, he could tell, should they ever be released, which of the people would be okay and which would not. And he wrote this. Everything you have in life can be taken from you except one thing. Your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. This is what determines the quality of the life we live. Not whether we've been rich or poor, famous or unknown, healthy or suffering. What determines our quality of life is how we relate to these realities, what kind of meaning we assign, what kind of attitude we cling to about them, what state of mind we allow them to trigger. Perhaps the central purpose of the third act is to go back and to try, if appropriate, to change our relationship to the past. It turns out that cognitive research shows when we are able to do this, it manifests neurologically. Neural pathways are created in the brain. You see, if you have, over time, reacted negatively to past events and people, neural pathways are, are laid down by chemical and electrical signals that are sent through the brain. And over time, these neural pathways become hardwired. They become the norm, even if it's bad for us because it causes us stress and anxiety. If, however, we can go back and alter our relationship, revision our relationship to past people and events, neural pathways can change. And if we can maintain the more positive uh, feelings about the past, 
that becomes the new norm. It, it's like resetting a thermostat. You know, it's, it's not having experiences that make us rise. It's reflecting on the experiences that we've had that makes us rise and that helps us become whole, brings wisdom and authenticity. It helps us become what we might have been. Women start off whole, don't we? I mean, as girls, we're feisty. Yeah, who says? We have agency. We are the subjects of our own lives. But very often, many, if not most of us, when we hit puberty, we start worrying about fitting in and being popular. And we, we become the subjects and objects of other people's lives. But now, in our third act, it may be possible for us to circle back to where we started and know it for the first time. And if we can do that, it will not just be for ourselves. Older women are the largest demographic in the world. If we can go back and redefine ourselves and become whole, this will create a cultural shift in the world. And it will give an example to younger generations so that they can reconceive their own lifespan. Thank you very much. So, um, Jane Fonda gave this talk about eight years ago. She is now 82 and still on her path of doing what she thinks she needs to do. Right now, she's going out and getting. Have you ever wanted to stay young a little longer? It's like put off aging. This is a dream of the ages. But scientists have for a long time thought this was just never going to be possible. They thought, you know, you just wear out. Since you... um, right now she goes out and gets arrested every Friday because she's interested in demonstrating for uh, saving the earth, the environment for our, the future generations. So she's still an activist. And you could find your own staircase, right? Think of her arch versus staircase, right? She talks a lot about repairing relationships from the past as a way of healing and living better in the future. There are different ways you can, you can, you can think of how you would uh, define things for yourselves. But the important thing is what she says is as you grow older, as you find peace within yourself, being, uh, as you age, you will find it's, it's a pretty happy place to be in. And you are free to do a whole bunch of things. Right? So let me just interrupt briefly and welcome Rita Ji. We started about 15 minutes late. So I'll just finish in about 10 minutes and then I'll in introduce you, but welcome, thank you. So when you think of the staircase metaphor, um, figure out how you're going to journey up your own staircase. You won't have the same capabilities at 50 that you had at 18, or have the capabilities you had at 50 when you're 80. Right? It doesn't matter. Our bodies and minds change as we age. We have to adjust to some measure of reality, accommodate our lives to, to adjust our lives to accommodate those changes. But as we talked about a few minutes ago, if you focus on the body, mind, and spirit, or body, mind, soul, and spirit, right? Um, you can start to address these themes, and I'll give you kind of a, a, a recipe for uh, what you need to address. I'll go through these quickly, and you, you can address, think about those later. Eat healthy right? Exercise and stay physically active. Get regular health checkups and don't forget part of that is good dental and vision checkups, right? Don't ignore any health warning signs. Men especially are macho. They tend to put things aside or men are scared to it sometimes to, to say, oh, I may have a health problem more than women do, right? 
but don't ignore health warning signs. Earlier you catch something, the better off you are. Secure your financial future the best you're able. And unfortunately in our current day, this is a issue for many people, but the best you can, right? Self-relief, stress relief, mindfulness techniques, meditation, whatever we call it, but try and calm the mind, right? Keep your mind active, learn every day, right? And stay socially connected with family and friends. This, these are, this is sort of the relief, the, the, the recipe, if you will, for healthy aging, successful aging, positive aging. And when you've done that, when you find your own staircase and you start to give back to the community, you will have achieved healthy and successful aging. And as I said, learn every day, learn something new. Right? And then you can start to do things that you never dreamt of that you'd be doing. I'm an aerospace engineer who spent 40 years doing engineering. I didn't know I, would, I was going to be here now. Right? Five years ago, I didn't know I was going to be here now. Right? But if you set yourself free and explore, you don't know where things are going to take you. Right? So you reflect. Remember what Jane Fonda said? Reflect on your past and learn from it. Right? You let go. Things that are unimportant to you, we put too much attachment to it. Let go, learn to let go, learn to let be, learn, journey. It could be a physical journey, it could be a virtual journey, right? Dream. If you don't take a risk, right? If you don't take those first steps, you're never, never going to take the second and third, right? Dare to do things. Experiment, try 10 things, two of them may work, right? Don't feel yourself constrained in a box, right? In just in the last three months, I've learned to become a videographer. I've actually learned how to shoot videos, how to process videos, how to add sound, how to add music, how to stitch videos together. And I did this because I wanted to create something new and uh, I created something called for, for Sukum, the organization that Rita and I work for. I created a new series modeled after TED Talks called Sukum Talks. And I've created two of those now and I've got three more in the, in the everything from scratch, right? If you, if, you, if you try, you can learn. It's not as good as it could be, but it's, it's there, it's, you know. And give, give to others. Give more than you receive, right? If you do all of this, you will find Sukkum. It's not hard to do. So I'm towards the end of it, another five minutes. The good news about aging, again from a societal context, is that people, if they embrace all the things that I've discussed in the last uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes, benefit not just themselves, but society. And you recall two or three different instances we say that the best part of healthy aging is to benefit others, right? Jane Fonda said this, I've said this, we'll say it again. Older people are happier and the last third of their lives can be the best years for themselves and for contribution to society. It's an adventure, it's, it's fun, you know, it's, it's, it's uplifting, you, know? you, you gotta bounce like a ball, right? Uh, Laura, Carstensen, um, Rita G. knows her. She is the a psychologist and founding director of the Stanford Center, Center on Longevity. Uh, this is the quote that she has, and I'll read it to you. She says, to the extent that the majority of people arrive at old age mentally sharp, physically fit, and financially secure, the problems of individual and societal aging fade away. We can shift the conversation then about to long life, and have a whole different aging society, one that will ultimately be engaged in and contribute to families, communities, and workplaces that we can never imagine. Don't sideline those old folks and say, you know, get out of my way. This is an attitude I find amongst the younger generation that troubles me. I have personal experience of walking down a sidewalk or footpath, as we would call it in Bengaluru. Um, 
where this young woman was walking by, busy street, you know, side of footpaths are crowded in India in a marketplace. And she kind of pushed this older lady aside and says, old lady says, you know, why are you getting in the way of people here? Why don't you just go back to where you, be, you are? So that attitude, that societal attitude towards older people has to change too. Not everybody's like that, but I'm saying that exists, right? So older people can have valuable contributions to society if we just let them. The fact that they're physically frail doesn't mean that they are incapable of doing things for you. So this is a course that's bounded in the Hindu traditions. And in Hinduism, we talk about the ashramas of life, right? We talk about brahmacharya, grihastha, vanaprastha, and sannyasa. Right? This is not a lecture on, 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 on the ashramas. But I'm saying, given that Hindu, Hindu tradition, how do we reconcile that concept? You know, I have finished grihastha. It is now my role, my duty, to don those saffron robes and go into vanaprastha, right? Runs, renunciate all life. Right? How many of us practically in this day, a day and age even think about that as an option? In my life, I know of one person, my mother-in-law's cousin, who renounced life, actually put on saffron robes and went into an ashram in Bihar. Right? The question then uh, uh, we ask is, as we transition out of Grihastha, can we redefine Vanaprastha and Sannyasa for our present age? This is a topic for discussion for us, topic of thought, topic for reflection. Right? It's easy to do if everything's all set, but what about those 60, 70, 80 year olds who still do not know where the next meal is coming from? How many people like that do you think there are in this world? An enormous number. Right? Can they afford even to do that, right? What about us empty nesters who enjoyed a good life? Kids are away, retirement age. What do we do next? We face that emptiness, right? How do we deal with the emptiness of a transition? Think of that in the context of healthy aging. So can we embrace the concept of the ashrama spiritually, adapt it to our times, while finding joy and fulfillment, right? And work for the benefit of our communities. You notice I keep coming back to this theme that an important part of healthy aging, successful aging, right? Positive aging is giving back to the community. In doing so, you give to yourself. So healthy aging is not an end goal, but a lifelong journey. Okay. Now this presentation is going to be available to you on Moodle. There is a set of references that is also in the lesson plan document that you can go look at. I've drawn on some of these references in, in the material that I've put together. There is also an excellent uh, video on um, healthy aging that I'm not showing for interest of time, but it's available. You, you can um you can review it and now um we have two choices if there are a couple of quick questions we can address them uh otherwise i guess krishnaji the next thing would be for me to bring address introduce rita ji and bring her in right so either online or in the class uh if there are a couple of questions we, we will probably have another uh, set of time at the end to, to do yes. q a correct yes. Okay. It's up to you if they want to post up questions. Any thoughts, questions, or shall we move on afterwards? Okay. Um, so if you can just set the next one up while I introduce. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, what I want to do next is briefly, and uh, Krishnaji already gave you an excellent introduction of Kitaji, but I want to add a few personal words. First, Rita Ji is a good friend, right? 
Second, she is a volunteer with Sukhum, with me, and we, we work hand in hand, hand in glove on different things to help convey the message of Sukhum to, to the community. The third, we are lucky indeed to have her here today because she is an expert on aging. Yuta Ji has had a lifelong experience in the topic. She is, an, uh, she is the person responsible for setting up, uh, initiated, conceptualized, set up the aging services, uh, 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 aging, adult aging services at Stanford. She directed that program for a long time. Um, widely recognized in the community as an expert in aging, cognitive vitality, dementia, elder care, geriatrics, gerontology, the whole works. Um, and she currently has uh, 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 her own program that she runs called Aging 101. I have, we have a reference to that in, 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 the, in, in, in the reference material. And she spends her time helping others deal with aging in the family network and she will and in the course of the next two lectures she will introduce uh, more, uh, you more to, to the topic but at this point i think i am privileged and you are privileged to have rita ji come talk to us so, so I just uh, thank you. Yeah. You, just you just need to press the up, up, up button. Up, down, okay. Good. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Mukund, for that wonderful introduction. I don't deserve all that he said, but he is himself a person that is uh, exemplary and such an icon. Um, I, I know it's afternoon and it constant talking might make you a little tired of listening. Um, I will if there's anything you feel that you need to interrupt or ask a question, so we make it a little bit more interactive. Um, I'm gonna go through the course because I'm sure that's available to you. And Mukund, you, ex you explained about Sukham, right? I actually have it. Okay, so. I can just, yeah. So, you know, I spent my, I came from India and I came straight to Stanford and uh, probably spent last of my 25 years there. I did my postdoctoral work, then went on to create the aging program. But overall, this concept of aging is sort of, it's, it's just amazing. I have uh, 50 year olds, 60 year olds, 90 year olds. Uh, yesterday I was with a 100 year old uh, professor. You know, the questions are the same that we are talking about today. What is the meaning of life? And for myself, I find the transition is so amazing. I mean, you know, some time ago I was a student and then I became uh, a mother and now my daughter has a little baby, so I'm a grandmother. And it's, a, it's a, just a passage of life and you sometimes wonder where you are, what you do, and it just, um, it, it's just quite an involved process. So within this journey, I came to know about Sukham, which is a South Asian community of experts who've come together to talk to people. And not a day goes by when I have someone ask me a question, you know, I'm dealing with my father's illness, or my mother feels different today, or my uncle in India had a stroke, or how do I deal with dementia in a family member? So it goes on and on. Plus also the feeling of Suddenly, you know, you stand up one day and you say, what is my role in life? And I think something that you just discussed, Mukul. So Sukham is a network of all of these questions and a wonderful resource. And I think so, uh, Mukund has really created this. Most of us are just volunteers. We will help and, you know, work with this. I can, we can talk about it later. Um, aging is not a disease. So when I teach a class at Stanford or other places, um, most people think of aging as you know, decline or disarray or uh, different aspects, but aging is not a disease. You and I start aging from the minute we are born. And the average life expectancy, you know, previously it used to be 50, 60. And when I attended the United Nations Assembly on Aging, um, we realized that suddenly the life expectancy has become 75 and many people are living up very healthy in their 80s. So why do you think we are living so long? Can one person give me one answer? Yes. 
of anybody. Exactly. So you think modern medicine. So I remember the time when I started working at Stanford Hospital, uh, people would just die, they would have a heart attack and they would pass away, or they would have a stroke and they would pass away, but people just don't have that problem anymore. So the modern medicine, so we have really prolonged life. And I think there's a wonderful side to it that people live long, but there's also not a wonderful side to it, which is people who are living with chronic disease can live for many years with a poor quality of life. And that's something which we deal with all the time. Um, aging is unstoppable. So what makes uh, a 90 year old person that's healthy versus a 90 year old person that's bedridden and unhealthy. It can be the lifestyle, it can be the genes, it can be the environment, many things, excuse me, attitude, also the attitude. So I think Mukund, you've already talked about successful aging. I think this is something that I'll probably come back to. I'm not gonna go through this. Um, I'm gonna put this at the end. Okay, so today my topic that Mukund had asked me to uh, talk about is the ingredients of cognitive vitality. This is an area that I've been involved in research for many, many years. And what does this really mean? What does cognitive vitality really mean? So, so far I feel there has been a, a, in, a, a constant interest in the heart, heart health. You know, there's a South Asian heart health in uh, Mountain View. Um, most people will run to the cardiologist. You know, to us, a healthy body feels like a healthy heart. But we have not really looked at the healthy brain for a long time. And suddenly people started noticing that the brain is an equal, if not more important part of our body. So how do we keep our brain healthy? And uh, anybody here in the audience want to tell us, what do you think about, what is, what is the first thought that comes to mind when you think of brain health? Meditation, very good. Okay, you've got all the answers. You should be teaching the course. <laughs> yes, what else? Mindfulness. mindfulness, that's very, what does mindfulness mean to you? It's just being present. Awareness. Awareness, excellent. What else does cognitive vitality mean to you? Being able to connect to people. Excellent. Okay, so cognitive vitality, the word, so I'm gonna to go to, uh, what is, um, uh, the, I'm sorry. I think some things are, okay. sorry, let me go back. Okay, so that's okay. Um, so the word cognitive vitality comes from the word cognition, and I think it appears in a couple of more slides and I will explain. So what does cognition mean? Cognition means the process of thinking, you know, your mind. And it's a very, very large term, cognition. You know, we have cognitive psychology, which we do as a course. We have cognitive sciences. And nowadays, as you know, most of your artificial intelligence, you know, software, so much of it is based on what we call cognitive sciences, which is trying to create what the brain is thinking. Um, so um, I think um, for some reason, look, I'm gonna, if you don't, I'm gonna, st yeah, I'm gonna just go ahead. Okay, that's okay, I'm sorry, yeah. So look at this slide here. So you have the green, which is the full head, hopefully all of us are here. And then you have the middle one, which has got some things lacking in it. And then the next one has got something which is a lot of loss, okay? All right, so the word cognition, this is what I was looking for. Cognition is thinking and it is, so when we do cognitive tests, we look at so many things. So think of something like a intelligence test. I don't know if any of you have done an intelligence test and I'm here two people nodding. So when you, when, you, when you do a test, just when you say cognition or intelligence, there are so many pieces to it. It is memory, perception, judgment, logic, inference, all of these combined to make who we are in terms of our cognition. Now, when you are normally aging, like today, I don't know how many of you in this room have difficulties with uh, forgetting where your keys are. None of you are yet that old, but you know, I find that all the time. I go into a parking lot and if I have not written it down, I forget it. But I did not have that problem some years ago. And why is that? Just like anything else, a baby steps and you know how a young adult moves, the brain like a muscle also ages. So that there are many changes in the brain. So for example, uh, quick recognition, quickly being able to do a puzzle, all of these are changes in the brain. 
And why is this important today? Why is this an important matter when we talk about aging or when you talked about all the wonderful answers you gave about uh, aging and mindfulness and meditation? Because remember, it is the mind body setup that we are talking about, okay? So the brain becomes a very important part. So I'll give you an example of two patients that I visited uh, last week. Both of them are in a facility because both of them reside in facilities. Uh, one of them has a very unhealthy body. They have chronic uh, diabetes. They have some chronic uh, residue of cancer. So they are in an assisted living. The other patient I visit has dementia. And in one of them, for the person with, the de with dementia, uh, there is really... The, the life that he has around him is just in the moment. He remembers some things of the past, but the present is sort of kind of diffuse. So you have in two instances, a body aging and a mind aging, okay? And when you talk about all of these disorders of the brain, that's not just because somebody is aging, it's because somebody has disease of the brain. So this is very important for you as you move on, as counselors, as scholars, as people in the community, you will realize that if elder care becomes a part of your life, whether it's your own parent or somebody in the community or an uncle or a spouse, that brain aging becomes a huge factor. And you know, there's a lot of research that Harvard has done and they found that when they do a survey, people say they are more scared of dementia than of cancer because dementia takes away, takes away. And unless you understand what dementia, the details are, you will not be able to appreciate what the person is going through because, you know, um, so, so let's uh, move to the next one. Now, what is normal aging in terms of brain aging? So as I just said, that there will be some changes that you and I will face and we are already facing. Uh, being able, able to quickly do something in your mind or uh, a quick judgment or a quick uh, rationality or something like that. These are some changes that will occur as we age in the brain. However, some things are not normal. Why is it so important for you to know? Let's say you have a relative or a friend and you notice that they have unusual memory loss. Now, memory loss can be where Many of us forget, when you see somebody, you forget a name. And when sometimes, you know, you look at something and you say, hmm, I've done this before and I've been here, but I can't remember. So there are many tests that we do. I do this testing of patients that I do in my lab, whereby we look at patients and we say, is this normal or is this not normal? So what is not normal is where, where there is actual significant short-term memory loss. And by short-term memory losses, for example, if I suddenly ask you, uh, what did you have for dinner yesterday? You may suddenly not be able to remember, but if I give you some cues, you may be able to remember. Oh, yesterday was Saturday, I sat with my family, I ate this. So there are many things called short-term memory that you will remember. The other things are like, if you notice, and this is such a common thing for a patient to call me, or for an adult child to call me, they'll say, you know, I've been visiting my mother very often. And now lately when I go, I notice that the house is not clean. Um, I notice that she's unable to balance her checkbook. She's showing poor judgment. She just recently gave $5,000 away to somebody. So these are changes that are happening, planning, judgment, decision-making. Confusion with time, getting lost, very important factor. Withdrawing from social activities that you did before and then changes in mood and personalities. If somebody comes and tells me that they are showing, seeing all of this, now many people will say, hmm, somebody's old, but it's not okay. This is not a sign of normal aging. This is a sign of abnormal cognitive aging. And it is very important that you keep this in mind. Okay. Um, so now memory is something that, you know, I just wanted to, it's a hard slide to see, but uh, this is again a slide because I, I teach at a, a graduate course level of neurology. So memory is an important part of our daily life. And I think one realizes how important memory is when one deals with patients that do not have memory. And that's, that's a very important part of, uh, so when you look at memory, uh, why is it hard to teach somebody who has memory loss because 
that memory that we are talking to them about doesn't go into the part of the brain where they can call upon it. You and I know we can retrieve parts from our brain. You know, we look into it, it's almost like a puzzle box. Okay. So there are different places like the amygdala, the hippocampus. Uh, these become important centers and injury or disease in these places are an, are an important part of uh, brain function. So let me talk a little bit about some of the terms of what is cognitive aging. Now I have many patients that have what they call MCI, which is called mild cognitive impairment. And you know, what it means is that there are many individuals that have some amount of memory loss, but who can actually function quite well. So they can, they can carry about day-to-day -day activities, accepting that they may have some uh, decline in, you know, so memory can become a little uh, problematic area in this case. And people who have MCI, they can be at risk for getting dementia at a later age, and I'll explain what dementia really means. It is important for you to just know this term. It's called MCI, and it's called mild cognitive impairment. And many, many individuals will go on uh, to have this particular uh, problem. Now, why is it important for you to know this? If you are an advocate, or if you are helping someone, or if you are in a community position, you can tell them, please go see a neurologist. Please go see your primary care doctor. Let them do a test on you. And if you do have MCI, then there are some tools that you can utilize. And I will come to those later on when we, when we wind up. Let's talk about dementia. Now, most of you have, have, are any of you here, do you know somebody with Alzheimer's or with dementia? You do? Some of you do, okay. So what exactly is this word dementia? People talk about it all the time and it's a, it's a very scary term. And many times people will say, um, they'll come and ask me, Rita, what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? Does anybody know the difference here? The difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So dementia is a general term. It's a big term. Think of it as a big box. It's, it, the word is dementia there are almost 20 kinds of dementias now. And the, ty the type of dementia that you probably have heard of the most is Alzheimer's. We've all heard of Alzheimer's disease. You know, President Reagan had Alzheimer's disease, but he did pretty well till a certain age. There are many people in our community, in people we know uh, who end up having this terrible syndrome. And it is there is so much research being done, billions of dollars are being spent, but we still don't have a cure. We still haven't come close to it. And it is kind of shocking why, but it is something that is becoming a difficult uh, diff problem. So today's talk is really about, can we prevent any of this? Can we safeguard any of this? Or if you know what is dementia and you know what Alzheimer's disease is, can you help someone? who actually is going through with it, or maybe an adult child that's dealing with it in their parents. You are all going to be pillars in the community. You probably are. How can you help someone like that? And at the end of my talk, I've created, like I created the memory program at Stanford, which just helps, you know, some tips. If you know someone, what can you do? And all that is there in the talk. So there are many kinds of dementias, as I said, but Alzheimer's is probably the most well-known. And uh, there is another one that is associated with high blood pressure and strokes, which is called vascular dementia. So these are all just terms that, you know, for you to know. And remember, if any of you have an interest in this, or if you are uh, wanting some particular uh, assistance, you're always welcome to, you know, email me and I'm happy to help. So no cure yet. Now the problem comes up and I just showed this slide because you know many times an adult child will come up to me and say, you know, my father is so difficult to deal with. You know, he behaves, he has no judgment, he has no memory, but um, I don't know how to deal with him. And then I tell them, you know, this is actually a biological disease. He's not doing this to upset you. He, it is a disease. So if you look at the brain on the top, you can see how red it is. It's, it's a rich brain with a lot of um, you know, vessels, and you can look at the brain below. Both of these are after autopsy, so you can see how much the brain has changed. It tells you that the loss in the brain 
for patients with dementia is acute. Okay. What are the causes? There are some damages that occur in the cells of the brain, and we do not know why. There is some kind of family history that runs, but in many cases, there is really not much correlation. We know people who have been brilliant people, people who exercised, who you have read, and they still get this disease. So there is not much correlation, but we are discovering facts every day. It affects different people in different times. And then those with preventive behaviors, which is what we're gonna talk about today, do quite well. Uh, and you know, you can, they have some kind of delayed onset, okay? So some of the ways to protect your brain, and I think something that uh, Mukunji had already talked about it, all of those are evidence-based practices we've just discovered in the last decade. So what, remember one thing, whatever is good for the heart is good for the brain. If you can keep that clear, and lately if you look at for the last, I think 10 to 15 years, there's been a huge push towards all academic centers, medical centers now moving towards brain health, uh, even as more than heart health, because I think heart we've kind of understood, but brain is still a little bit, you know, we're still getting there. So this was the biggest study that has been done to, to date, and it's called FINGER because it was in Finland, and it's the word is geriatrics, which is uh, G-E-R, which I think uh, we've already talked about what is geriatrics, so it's called the FINGER study. And this was a landmark study that was done, uh, which kind of made people realize that all these wonderful things we've been talking about, guess what? We gotta take them very seriously. So everybody talks about, oh, it's good to have a good night's sleep, have, have friends, um, you know, uh, have a good diet and uh, protect your brain from injury. But really today, it's, it's now evidence-based. Research has proved this way and beyond. Here are some of the findings. So routine screening, something that everybody has talked about, um, which is controlling your blood pressure. Most people, I think, um, have had this kind of a somewhat um, lackadaisical uh, attitude towards blood pressure. They have not taken it very, I, I see somebody in the back nodding their head because people feel that, okay, um, fine, this happens with, when we are aging. But remember, when you do have these small little things happening in your brain, uh, you know, I, I don't want to become technical, but we have seen that uh, it takes little, little activities in the brain for suddenly something to happen. So it is really important that, you know, we test our blood pressure and sometimes people start having blood pressure in their 40s to be able to talk about these things and mindfulness, meditation, yoga, all of these are associated with positive behaviors. So controlling blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, all of these, everything that leads to a good heart actually has a great impact on the brain limiting alcohol over medications, drug interactions. Now, older adults by tendency take more medications. My average patient has about six or seven medications. How many times do they actually go to the doctor and say, doctor, are these medications okay to still take? Now I'll give you an example as a case study. So I accompanied this patient because he lives alone he has nobody else. And he has counted on me ever since uh, his wife passed away uh, with uh, dementia. So I was helping at that time. And um, he uh, just, you know, for years on end, healthy habits, has never really been to the doctor or goes for 20 minutes, gets a checkup done and moves on. So lately he's been losing weight and he's been talking about memory loss and he's been talking about lack of energy. So I said, when was the last time you went to the doctor? So he said, uh, uh, you know, it was some time ago, I wanted to get my inhaler, my, he has some kind of bronchitis, uh, all of that done. I said, did you talk to your doctor about all of this? Well, who has the time? So here is where we come back, making time for older adults, making time to listen. So I said, why don't I come with you? And uh, I decided, and I, I enjoy these meetings because I learned so much and I'm also the advocate. So when we sat down, we had a list of questions and uh, I told the doctor, his primary care doctor, I said, could you just evaluate the medications this patient is on? And guess what? He's been taking some medications for the last 15 years and he's added and he's added and he's added. So finally he's got so many medications and he started having some side effects of some medication. So they got another medication. So all of these have become a jumbled mess. So the doctor took away 
most things and just put him back on the right blood pressure medicine and a few other medications and took away a lot. Some of the medications we take actually impact our memory. So, and again, remember one thing, as we get older, and it happens for me to all of us, the medications we took when we were in our 20s is different when our body is in our 50s or 40s because we have less water, we have less metabolism. So all of these are very important to do. Anyway, this is an example how you can be an advocate. Then you talk about vision, ruling out other diseases. Depression can often be mistaken for uh, kind of a, a dementia. Exercise. So the research found that there was actually, if you look at the second line, 40% reduced risk of dementia, and there was increased gray matter. There was a 2% increase in the hippocampus site. Hippocampus is a part of the brain, and this is over a long period where they've actually placed electrodes, they've looked at you know, pre-test, post-test, and they found that all of these changes happened in the brain. Now, up till now, we always thought it's good to exercise, but now we have evidence that this really helps in, in the brain function. So I want to talk about cognitive reserve. Have any of you heard of this term, cognitive reserve? So this is where all these good things that you are doing today, the yoga, the mindfulness, the reading, the exercise, what it does is it's like putting money in the bank. Every time you do this, there's a little part of the bank that gets better and better and better. And then what happens is that when the disease like a dementia does hit, guess what? For you, it gets delayed. It gets delayed by almost five to six to seven years. So that's why exercise and all of these activities help because it delays the onset of the disease. And many times what happens is that, you know, we may not even experience this because in our normal lifetime, you may not experience this. So cognitive reserve, if you just remember that, that any time you do something for your brain, you're putting a little money in the bank for the brain, okay? Sleep. Up till now, people never thought about sleep like this. Sleep actually helps. Again, this big study did that sleep helps protect your brain. So think about it like this, like, you know, early in the morning, most of us who are from Indian origin, we believe in cleaning the house, you clean the, you know, your meditation room and all of that. So think of it like this, take a little broom when they are sleeping, the little broom cleans off all these free radicals in our brain and puts it away. But if you don't sleep, then all of these accumulate and they can cause the breakdown in the brains that we are seeing in, our, in, in the autopsy. Um, all of these, there are so many, I mean, most of you may have uh, sleep deprivation can have severe side effects. So it, it impacts and uh, how many of you in this room sleep well? I Did you? Excuse me? Well, I would say a good six to seven hours uninterrupted, a good sleep that you wake up feeling refreshed. That's, yes, go ahead. You, you feel you are like that? I have a question. How do you know how much sleep you need? Because some say if you are doing your meditation and uh, your amount of sleep that you need is reduced. So how do we know? Is it enough for me, like five to six? So the, the typical standard is, and this is something to ask your doctor based on your overall health, but I would say that the ideal time is about the six to seven hours is something which is considered to be a good sleep, regardless of what else you do. And eight hours can be a very good sleep. Remember, sleep actually helps us. This is where they are doing, you, you can also look up some uh, sleep journals. There's some really good research coming out as to what they call the therapeutic and the healing effects of sleep. And you know, sleep really helps rejuvenate because those brain cells that are active throughout the day that are you know, sort of spitting out all these things they need to calm down, they need to sleep. So sleep has considered a big thing. Now, I would say when you ask a question like that, just because I do meditation, just because I do a mindfulness or I, I walk or exercise, I think this is a question that you need to look at your body. Do you have blood pressure? Do you have any other chronic disease? You know, what, what kind of amount of sleep is important? Besides that, some people, like you say, have uh, disrupted sleep. And you can do this like, you know, I remember my husband has this tendency to snore. So we got him to do a sleep study. And they realized that his sleep is actually very disruptive. 
So every so often you can make out and that's not good. So again, this is a clinical question to be asked, but sleep does help in cognitive uh, therapy. I mean, cognitive therapeutics, yes. Okay. So then healthy eating. Yes, please. Um, so on the previous chart, you said uh, don't take naps during the day. Yes. I've done a lot of recent reading that says it's, it's good. beneficial to take 10, 15 minutes oh, or naps and so on. So how do you reconcile this? So again, so the reason that is said, you know, here's the thing. If you look at the research that's coming out now, what tends to happen is that older adults, if they take naps and their metabolism is already slow, remember, this is more towards the older population, then they have a tendency of not sleeping at the right time because they tend to doze off. And I think that there is a correlation with, you know, people dozing off in the middle and the kind of continuity of sleep. But on the other hand, if you're someone who's used to these power naps and that is good for your system, which is why it is a, such a, it's a very unique question to be asked. So one can presumably interpret that then in saying that- um, If that takes if away. The daytime nap takes away your ability to sleep at the right time and sleep well through the night, then you should avoid the daytime. That, that, that's a good way to say it. And I'm just going by, you know, the recommended, you know, kind of algorithm that we talk about. And, you know, again, many people just need that half an hour, you know, and, and you know, our culture is such like in India and Mexico, they're just used to that. Yeah. Yes, yes. After the meal. Yes, yes. And one of the things that... And then that is one of the reasons why there is a huge predominance because I'm you know, married to somebody from Southern India, this whole syndrome X is so prevalent about that whole, you know, the, the trilogy of diabetes, hypertension and uh, cholesterol. So again, not to discount what is a good habit, but I think that if you're moving forward, if you're focused on good sleep, again, a good question to maybe monitor and see, do you feel refreshed when you wake up? And what can work for one person Mukun, may not work for another person. But you know, we are going towards people who really have disrupted sleep. And that can be a, a damaging thing, you know, because when you're looking at the big picture, you need to look at all these factors. Uh, I think my personal experience really not stress physically work out. Like, uh, I run less than you get a sleep that is the uh, most time you sleep. Of course. Uh, sleep simply rolling on the bed. Like, you know, right. You're sleeping, but right. not Right, right. This, like, in the sleep, you feel like the uh, hormone yeah. releases. Right. That is the best, like, you know. Excellent. Know, they say, like, you, know, they you have a glass of wine, and I don't drink, but you feel like that. <laughs> and I relax, your body relaxes, like, kind of that. Very good. Physical activity. Physical activity, yeah. yeah. Very good. I, I love that, what you said. That's a great, great I mean, tip to share. So, and with these factors are all contributing. All of them are. Just one Exactly. And, you know, remember, we are all, I mean, the reason for even today's getting together is when you talk about successful aging, all of us, you know, not everything is going to work for all of us. But overall, the big picture is an important. Now, this is an area that I think that we are losing because so many people are not socially, you know, engaged anymore. Our older adults are kind of very, very uh, isolated, and it's a huge matter. So from our social perspective, from medical perspective, this is a huge loss. Uh, most of my patients, when they they get into a facility and they are isolated, they kind of really plummet. Um, moving away from a family is huge. I wanted to take a quick minute. I'm part of a collaborative research we're doing, and I think I've shared this incidence with the, in the last meeting, so Mukun may know about it. Uh, we are testing populations in Japan, in Mexico, India, and in the US, and we're looking at patients with dementia. And what we found is that with the same level of dementia, like the same kind of um, mild or moderate and all that, people in Mexico and India are doing so much better. I think you know the reason why. And I recently have an aunt that clinically got diagnosed with dementia because she went to the hospital after a fall, but she does not show any such. She does not show the behavior. She's still living in a joint family. She still gets up and fights with the servants and the maids and the hacks. And, and they're haggling over the price of the milk and the butter and the, you know, all of that. And people are coming every day. She's engaged with her grandchild. You know, that is such an important part of day-to-day -day life. And if I look at the same person with the same diagnosis and I look at them in an isolated community, 
they show so many more signs. So social engagement, you know, because every time you talk to someone, you're concerned. Like the, when I walked into this talk, it was about giving back, learning, asking, understanding. Not only is your brain working, but you're connecting. So social isolation, uh, isolation is now today the number one topic that it has reached CDC. And you know, CDC is the Center for Disease uh, uh, Control. Um, uh, and, and what is happening is they are finding the two diseases that have made it to the top there. One is for young women, postpartum depression, and the other is social isolation. They're realizing that a lot of the illnesses are coming up. So anytime you can do anything in terms of uh, this, this horrible uh, syndrome, you know, I would say do something because even getting people together for a prayer, for a exercise, for a lecture, for something, but social isolation is important. And I think, um, you know, the other thing, Mukund, that you and I keep talking about, because I am, I do talk to a lot of individuals who are aging in the United States. They grew up in, the, in India, but they've moved here because their children are here, a son or daughter or whatever. And this is, not their, this is not their central place. They don't know where to go. They're home most of the time. They report severe stress in terms of social isolation. They don't have the transportation to go somewhere. They don't have the people to talk to. They don't have the grocery store to walk to. They don't have people coming to their homes. So this has become a huge correlation and many people show what they call pseudo dementia that is you know, kind of behavior that is not dementia but is coming because of social isolation. So I would really request you as, as pillars of whatever uh, you, know, you, you go to build that you be aware of this and, and maybe create infrastructures to help this. Prevent injury. One of the reasons why brain disease is becoming such a big part of football and all of this is that uh, the uh, injury, any falls, all of these add to uh, problems. So overview, um, I want to end. Um, these are all the things that this is available in your, in your PowerPoint. These again together what I just discussed. So healthy aging starts with healthy behaviors. And one of the things I've done is uh, uh, I'm just going to I've, I've created what I call a toolkit. If any of you are actively helping somebody who's aging or some, you know, want to work in this field, this is like a toolkit to start with because it just doesn't start sudden, you know, there's, there's always a sign that something is going wrong. You can use this toolkit. And one more thing I wanted to show you, helping families with dementia. If you do come up with a family that is struggling with this. I have written out a few tips because this is a disease that is very different from anything else. And suppose a, a typical dementia patient will come in, like I have a patient, every evening you get worse in the evenings because that's when the twilight zone the, it bothers you. She will ask, um, I need to go to my husband. Her husband has passed away 10 years ago. But if you tell that person, your husband passed away 10 years ago, what are you talking about? they're gonna react very badly you, because the logic is gone, the, you know, the judgment is gone. So what you can do is you can say, let's go for a walk, let's, let's see what we do, distract them, walk around, accept their reality. So there are many tips of working with patients. This is a disease that takes a lot of patience. I admire people who are dealing with this in their families, which is why caregiver support becomes such an important part of our life. And do you know that the face of the caregiver is the woman the woman child, you know, who is constantly struggling to make matters, you know, uh, dealing with elder care, dealing with childcare, dealing with work. So this is an important part of life, which I'm sure men are getting into this, men are equally good caregivers and helping. So this will go on. I'm, again, these are areas that you can discuss and talk about. So I wanted to end there because I know we have another uh, session. So I want to be respectful. Okay. There's a comment that just came from online that is asking you to repeat the important points. Off. Summarize the important points of this presentation. Okay. So go back to the summary slide. Is that what you think? Okay. Or just so this is summarize the essence of salient points. Salient points. Okay, I can do that. Um, and if anybody has a question, I'm happy to answer that question. So, <laughs> so in terms of summary, I would say that today um, I uh, wasn't um, I wasn't here to listen to uh, Mukunji's talk, but I think I came into the part of where uh, we talked about successful aging and what exactly does it mean. A big part of this is, you know, 
taking care of yourself, but also giving back and taking care of others and building systems in the community. Um, we will all age. There's no getting away with that. And if you have to age, the maximum that you can age well is good. Physical aging is important. Cognitive aging is becoming even more important. So brain is a very critical part of our being. So far, we have not paid attention to it. And I think people are now paying a lot more attention. So it is really important to remember and keep that example in mind that just like how I take care of my heart, that in the brain, there's a little bank that every time I put a dollar in that bank, I'm strengthening my brain. And those are ways of you know uh, keeping yourself the sleep, the social engagement, the healthy habits, uh, and taking care of chronic disease and injury. I think what has happened is that why we are finding so much of illness in this particular uh, demographic today, which is you know from the age 70 to age 90, is that they never talked about prevention in terms of chronic disease. See, chronic disease was something that you know we never really looked into uh, cholesterol and diabetes and high, high blood pressure, obesity, sedentary lifestyles, and suddenly it caught up with us that you know, we are not looking into all this. And uh, uh, I'm not saying that everybody has to live up to be 100, we, we may not, our genes will tell us that. But as long as we can, a healthy brain is very important. And if we can do these preventive uh, methodologies, chances are we may delay the onset we still don't know the reasons of why dementia occurs. It's a, it's a topic by itself. I could teach eight hours into what this is. There are many kinds of dementias. But please remember that if you hear of someone with some kind of you know, memory concerns or other, you know, those immediate steps I told you where poor judgment, poor logic, please take the time to educate them. Tell them this is not normal. They need to see a doctor, they need to see a neurologist or a geriatrician, go through a lengthy set of testing. The testing usually involves a MRI, blood test, but a neuropsych testing which tests you on all the domains. And then you decide what needs to happen. I have seen wonderful instances where people with good structure, good exercise, good cues and learning have done quite well. And um, so that's, that's all I can say as summary. And uh, we are available if there's anybody that's actually struggling with dementia or with families. Um, I have a booklet that I've written, which is available. Um, I'm happy to give that, uh, provide that. So I can end with this. Uh, and if there are any questions, we can wait till the end. Thank you. Okay, that's a, it's a great question you asked. So I am also very active in, yes, 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 sorry, I'll go ask. So the question that was asked is that, um, is there, I, do I need to be doing this kind of a neuropsych testing for any kind of diagnosis, even if I have no problems? And the way I would answer is that, you know, I would say, so I'm part of a network of people where we are trying to do what we call preventive um, you know, work. Um, we are active in policy in Washington, D.C., where we are saying that just like at 50, you do a colonoscopy, why can't we do a brain test in 50, you know, or 40 or whatever. But I think that your neurologist or your physician is probably not going to uh, prescribe a neuropsych testing unless there is actual problem. And I have known many people, even in their 40s, who have come up to me and said, you know, Dr. Katak, I am finding that I am forgetting short-term memory. I've, I've already gotten lost a couple of times. I'm, I'm a little nervous. I'm concerned. And then immediately we will say, go ahead and get a proper testing done. But unless there is any need. I don't think there is any reason to. Uh, and so that's, that's the kind of answer. But if there's ever any question, uh, if you ever notice anything different from your baseline, I would always say speak to your primary care doctor who knows you. But in that context, um, you had mentioned earlier there are three or four or five signs that we non-clinicians can look for. Yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. So maybe that is one to be aware of what those signs are. Right, right. And if you see that start to 
is that a fair? Absolutely. So we have in our in this PowerPoint, if you look down or we are happy to provide, is what we call like, you know, you have the warning signs of heart disease, you have the warning signs of cognitive problems. So some things could be like forgetting short-term memory aspects. Something could be balancing a checkbook, which you could have done before. Uh, something could be like losing your way or could be just lack of decision making uh, you know, situation. So all of these and typically what will happen is that you may not notice them, but someone else may notice that in your family or you may notice that in a parent. And typically that's what happens in most of our people who are in this field where somebody comes and says, you know, I've been noticing these changes in my parents and they were perfectly fine up till now. Now, sometimes it could be a vitamin B deficiency. Sometimes it could be that they are just not well. There's been some other infection. It could be many things, which is why we always want to have a doctor do a basic screening. Sometimes depression can cause, I mean, you know, in the hospital setting, depression and dementia can be oh, sometimes, you know, interconnected. So, yeah, it's all of that. Okay. So that is an important, good question you asked. So up till now, the, the medications that came up many years ago, there are only two or three available. Uh, Aricep, Namanda, they are the only ones still available. We lost three very important uh, trials in the, uh, in the phase B trials because somehow this is a you know, we are just not getting the breakthroughs. Everybody's trying hard. Uh, so many centers are working on this. We still haven't found it, but many people are talking about it. But what they are talking about is trying to prevent, trying to kind of get ahead of it by, you know, not adding more injury to the brain so that, you know, there are other problems to it. But, so, so the, the medicines that are available right now are pretty much, you know, what they give you for when, when somebody is diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's, which is called Aricep, and it's, it's that's a generic name. And, uh, but other than that, there are some others that have come along, but nothing has happened, nothing has hit the market in the last 15 to 20 years. But there are medications for behavioral problems, like if somebody with dementia has behavioral problems, then there are these other kind of medications that a physician will pick. But so far, the, the treatment is somewhere in the horizon. We don't know yet. Everybody's racing for it, yes. Is it a reason because it's wide spectrum and it's not, uh, not, not, it's not easy to figure out what is exactly the reason? The reason. Not, I mean, honestly, Right. There's so much of research. If you're interested, there's so much of research going around inflammation. People are talking about inflammation. That is a huge area of research. Many people are talking about, I mean, it is something where I attended the World Congress of, on uh, Alzheimer's. It was just staggering the amount of research that's coming out. But today for the lay person, we still don't have. There are some really good MRIs that are available that people do so that they can get an early understanding if there are changes in the brain. But again, all of those are expensive. Uh, they're all, you know, yeah, start with the physician and start with the neurologist. Okay. Is it hereditary? Uh, somebody has in the family? So, right. So, for example, with Alzheimer's, there is a familial trait to it. So, sometimes it does continue again, not, not in some, sometimes it skips a generation. But there are so many other kinds of dementias as well. There is, you know, this whole Parkinsonian dementia, alcoholic related dementia, then you have vascular dementia. Uh, there is a very complex thing called the Lewy body dementia that is that is becoming very common. So it's just the gamut. But what people mostly, the mostly pre most prevalent is, uh, is, is Alzheimer's. Yeah. I have a question here online. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, well, most of the normal old people, uh, as they get older, they get less and less sleep. Is there a reason for that? Or is uh, some research being done how we can improve on it? Um, so the question is that as old people get older and older, there seems to be a problem with sleep. And you're absolutely right. Sleep by nature, you know, as you get older, sleep by itself tends to get less and less. And many people, you know, some call it because of anxiety. Some call it because, you know, they have to wake up many times to go to the bathroom. There are so many correlations that are there. Uh, you know, they try to restrict water in the evenings for people with overactive bladders. Then for some people, some of the uh, medications can uh, counteract that. But sleep is a big 
part of the syndrome of aging. And the way we answer this question is we say that if it is really disruptive, it is important to speak with not only a primary care physician, but to a geriatrician who understands the big picture as to why is it that your sleep has reduced and what are the reasons. And I know for a fact that when I sit in on these kind of meetings, we look at um, medicines that might be causing the problem, the number of times the older adult wakes up. And, but, but also in terms of physiology, you tend to sleep does tend to get lesser and lesser as you get older. Unfortunately, there's not much to be done. And that's a good question to ask your doctor. So I will end with that and then, okay, thank you. So, thank you, Rita Ji. Uh, we will take a short break for next 20 minutes. We convene at 3.25. 20 minutes? Yeah. Because we start till late, so. Yeah, My goodness, I'm connecting with two strangers. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Do you know if there's anywhere I can get batteries? Pardon? Do you know if there's somewhere nearby I can get batteries? Uh, Rajgarh, is there any way we can get some batteries? He's asking. Yeah, we can get them. I can get them. I can go get it. Maybe I need it here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I went to the Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I wonder if you
They're not coming back. <laughs> <They're not coming. laughs> this is the only way I can <laughs> call them. They're not coming back. Take them. Call me on the online. But there's four things. Yeah, you're a Raju Sanda, I think. You love it. <laughs> Does Sukho have an office yet? No offices in the we, we have a will. Did you guys want one? Hmm? I brought water We've never had any offices. No, but well, would you guys be interested in one? If we have a place that we can offer? No, but for meetings or like you guys coming together, a location. location. We, we have like, spaces in the meeting. Okay, Mukunji. Are there any additional resources that you guys have for people that are cognitive, cognitive loss or seniors who are like, I don't get that yet, so that you guys can provide those resources so that we can provide those resources? Well, it's not a Oh my goodness, so I think I 
Mukunji, yeah, you want to use the. No. Oh, who is going to do the next session? Uh, join. Yeah, you want to take the mic? No, I'll oh, do it from oh. there. I did the first one from there too. So. Okay. So, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to start our next session. That's uh, Aging 300 Fundamentals of Elder Care and uh, Geriatrics. And Mukunji, as well as uh, Rita Ji, will be presenting this session. Mukunji, you want to do first? Yeah. Thank you. So thank you, Krishna Ji. Uh, we've come to the the third talk in in the in the series today. Uh, you first heard about uh, healthy aging, positive aging, successful aging, and kind of a recipe and a, a little roadmap as to how you how you could get go down that path if you're not already on it. Uh, then Rita Ji talked about uh, uh, cognition and dementia, uh, about why it's uh, uh, as we were just beginning to learn why it's caused, about how to recognize the initial warning signs for it, um, uh, what sort of impact it can have on people's lives, and then also to talk about uh, uh, the uh, some some kind of recipes, some some ways of dealing with 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 people who have some cognition issues and some dementia issues. Uh, the third talk is something that both Rita Ji and I will, will give jointly. I'll sort of lead off and set the stage, the foundation, and then she will take, uh, take it forward to completion. And what we're going to address is, is uh, in, 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 in this next talk, is understanding that as people get old, they need care. It's the general topic of elder care. Um, sort of tell you, give you a picture of what the elder care situation is in, in the country today as well as the world, and then go from there to talk about how you could get in, what the elder care issues are, and what's, what are some of the things you can learn in the, in the arena if you're getting involved uh, uh, in, in the care for somebody in your family or friend circle, right? So the objectives of this course is, again, it's a practical course that gives you the, uh, uh, a basic knowledge base that you, that you can use as a springboard to go from, uh, provide an overview of geriatrics and elder care, and we'll define those terms for you, um, describe ways in which you can approach and deal with issue of caring for aging family members or aging friends, uh, talk to you about what really is a crisis, a serious, serious crisis in the area of caregiving uh, and the role of the caregiver. And then with this fundamental overview, uh, we would like to then set you up so you can deal with these issues in your friend and family circles or with issues that you may not may you very likely to encounter as a community service volunteer uh, going forward. So. That's what you should expect from, from, from this, this next hour, right? Uh, and at the end of this class, we will provide a small list of references. It's a curated list of resources. And that can be your starting point to go into more detail as you need to. And you can always come back to Sukham. You can always come back to Ritaji, you can come back to me uh, if you have specific questions and issues and we can help direct you to the uh, to the appropriate uh, solutions that you see. Okay, so let me start with some facts. Okay, and these are some hard facts. Uh, currently, and, and th these are statistics for the U.S., but the sort of general picture I'm going to paint is equally dire, if not worse, in other parts of the world. There are 42 million friends or family members who are primary caregivers for adults and children who have disabilities, individuals recovering from surgeries and illnesses, and those coping with Alzheimer's and other chronic diseases um, uh, in the friends and family circles. So 42 million people are primary caregivers, right? Many of these caregivers are themselves aging or, or elderly, right? Most of them, as Rita Ji pointed out earlier, are women. The predominant 
caregiving family is, is, is female. And statistics, and this is, if anything, an underestimate, uh, says that they provide 37 billion, B, billion with a B, hours of, in a year of unpaid care in the US. If I were earning minimum age at $37 billion an hour, a lot of money here, right? Talk about own dollars, right? There are 10 million adult children living with their parents and their parents are caring for them. Children in their 40s, I, I got a, a call from uh, in Sukhum uh, last year uh, for a lady who had moved to California, this area from another location. And her 40 year old autistic son lived with her and she needed some help to figure out some resources. Okay. So 10 million adult children are being cared for by their parents. Every day, 65 and over population increases by 10,000. So if you, if you talk about some of those people being healthy, some not. So every day, the population of people who are pretty soon going to require some kind of elder care is mushrooming, right? Close to a million, three quarters of a million, 700,000 adults in the US live with a uh, dis disability like autism with their parents or another family member who is at least 60 years old, right? So there's this aging population. There's this aging population of caregivers. So ask yourself this question. What happens when those caregivers are gone? What happens to this 40-year-old autistic man if he should lose his mother. Rita Ji talked about Alzheimer's and dementia. Right? Alzheimer's disease is expected to triple by 2050. Right? 10 years ago, it's about 4.7 4 million patients. Right now, it's touching 6 million. And by 2050, there's going to be close to 14 million people with Alzheimer's. It's currently the sixth leading cause of death according to the CDC in the US. Not Alzheimer's itself, but Alzheimer's related. The, 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 the complex set of circumstances and diseases and illnesses that people with Alzheimer's have leads to, uh, to death. That's what they mean. Yeah. How long is this Alzheimer's now? Six years, five years, ten years, fifteen years. It it uh you you I've I've known people with Alzheimer's who very rapidly deteriorate and are gone soon. I've known people who are around for 15, 20 years in nurturing care surroundings. My father had a combination of Parkinson's and some very version of dementia, Alzheimer's, right? Um, for about four, four or five years. Um, it's it's the, there's there's no number like that, uh, but all we know is that uh, it generally affects people who are older. But there's also what's called early onset Alzheimer's, where where people can get Alzheimer's in their forties and fifties. So if they're physically healthy. <clears throat> their lifespan could be another 40 years, right? Um, Rita Ji mentioned the statistic, 15% uh, of people over 70 have has some kind of dementia. In fact, if you live to be 90, there's a one in two chance, 50% chance you'll have some, some kind of dementia. That, those are the statistics that we have. So given this mushrooming caregiver crisis, you ask ourselves, what's the support available, right? Um, so people need 24-hour care sometimes, you know, morning, day, and night, right? Uh, that population is increasing. 
in the US, for every 20,000 older adults living with a severe chronic illness, not necessarily Alzheimer's, yeah, just a severe chronic illness, there's only one specialist for every 20,000 people. Yeah. Palliative care, you'll hear more about palliative care and hospice care in a future lecture. Table the, what the meanings are now, but it generally means palliative care is support for someone with a seriously illness, serious illness, over and above the cure, uh, the treatment they're getting. Hospice care is end of life care. Um, there are only 1,600 hospital palliative care teams across the country. Only 5,000 hospice programs in the U.S. So these are specialists who can help deal with these issues. 18,000 physicians in this country of 330, 40 million who are focused on palliative and hospice care. So you can see the mismatch here, right? So what happens? The burden goes on friends and family. Right? So this is a policy question. This is a, a humanitarian crisis. There's a need to educate and train a caregiver work workforce of the future. You see the number of nursing uh, uh, companies offering home, home health aids and this blossoming across. They see this growing need and there is a partial response to it, but that costs money. Right? If you can't afford $30 an hour for somebody to come eight hours a day to look after somebody at home, you're not going to do that. What do you do? You do the best you can by yourself. Right. So that's the background with which we are trying to give you the perspective of what we do next. And I'm going to talk to you uh, briefly for another five, five, six minutes, and then Rita, you will pick up for me uh, and, and, and continue from where I stop. <clears throat> so I'll start with two definitions. And I think it's important to understand these so that you understand the dialogue and discussion that goes around. The term gerontology, Ritaji used in her talk earlier, it's the study of the social, psychological, cognitive, and biological aspects of aging. Right? Ritaji is a qualified gerontologist. Geriatrics, on the other hand, is a medical specialty. It's the branch of medicine that deals with older adults people over 65, people over 75, you draw a line, but older adults. So what's the other, other end of the spectrum from geriatrics? Pediatrics, right? So pediatrics and geriatrics and all the tricks in the middle, right? So geri geriatrics is really a specialization. A pediatrician will feel unqualified to deal with an adult because there are techniques that you have. So similarly, not every doctor is well versed in taking care of the aged. So geriatrics is a specialty that's growing. Now, in addition to gerontology and geri geriatrics, for us, cultural, a, a minority cultural group in a country like, like the US, gerodiversity is a newer term, but is an important term that you need to sort of think about. And that is for people like us who come from a different culture, who have different cultural, social, spiritual needs, right? How best can gerontology and geriatrics address us in treating our, us as we grow older, right? It's what may be good for somebody from the Baltic countries or somebody from the African countries, or somebody from the South, South Asian uh, community, or someone from Europe, or someone who's Native American, right? They're all different needs that you have to understand if you're going to be able to treat the whole person. And you'll notice that you'll see, especially when uh, uh, Rita Ji talks, that elder care, Geriatrics and all is, is, is a multifunctional approach to, to taking care of the whole person. So gerodiversity, looking at the multicultural approaches of aging is important so that 
understanding the e ecosystem in which they live. We living in the Bay Area is different from us living in some town in India, right? Um, so taking care of the context of our cultural her heritage, social environment, family system, the relationships that are important to us is very critical in how we teach. In fact, Rita Ji alluded to that a while ago when she was talking about taking care of uh, uh, pe people with, with dementia. I'm going to quickly go through what what is defined as the the ten cardinal principles of geriatrics. Just so you, I'm I'm just going to go bullet by bullet. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Rita Ji will allude, allude to some of these. She already mentioned this one slide, and I told you this at the outset, right? All these lectures will sort of talk to each other and overlay each other. Aging is not a disease. It's influenced not just by your, physic, your, your, your physicality, by the environment, your genes, your lifestyle, your access. If you have good access to clean water, medication, you're likely to be more successful aging than if you're going to have to stand uh, in a queue of 500 people at a tap to fill a plastic bucket once a week for water for your home. Medical conditions are not siloed all by themselves. They're commonly, commonly chronic, they're acute, you have flare-ups, but there are multiple conditions with multiple factors in uh, defining each one of them, right? So if you go to a specialist to treat problem X and that specialist does not know your history, he or she is less likely to be able to treat you well than by understanding the whole uh, thing. We talked about healthy aging. What did we talk about, say? Functional ability is, is one of the key points, right? So functional ability and quality of life are critical outcomes for a geriatric intervention for, for, for teaching somebody. This is one of the issues is that if we could have figured out some problem early enough, diagnosed it early enough, we could have prevented it from becoming a problem, right? So reversible and treatable conditions are very often undiagnosed or underdiagnosed, and very often not just undertreated, untreated, because people just don't pay attention to things or don't have access to care or can't afford it. If I have to decide whether I should fill my prescription medication or buy my groceries in a week. And believe me, significant number of people, we are privileged not being there, have to, have to face that reality, right? And then I, I've mentioned this before, social history, social support, what kind of uh, uh, quality, what kind of uh, support you have at home, uh, what you like, what you don't like, are all essential things that a, a geriatrician needs to know in order to manage your condition well. Okay. Rita Ji already talked about this. Cognitive and affective disorders that result from that are quite prevalent, but we don't figure it out until it's too late. So being smart enough or educated enough to recognize early warning signs is something we should all strive for. Understand this so we can spot it in our friends and our families and our community and help others, right? Iatrogenic Yetro illness. This is something where I go into to an auto mechanic shop to get my car treated and the mechanic does something that actually makes the car worse. Happens in hospitals with doctors all the time. You go in for a routine checkup, a routine treatment, something like that. And the act of medical treatment creates an illness. You have a catheter installed and you end up with a urinary tract infection. With adults, aging adults who have multiple things happen to them, this kind of illnesses are very common and many hospitals, all good hospitals, the prime focus is to eliminate or reduce these as much as possible. But this is a fact of life. It takes a village to raise a child. 
it takes a village to take care of an adult, right? Pediatrics, geriatrics, is all the same thing, yeah? What's that poem about hair? What newborn babies and old men, right? Yeah. <laughs> so second childhood has a real meaning up here, right? And geriatric care happens in a bunch of places. The best places for an adult to be is where he or she feels comfortable, where she or she feels at home. Not everyone has that luxury. So some people end up in long-term care institutions. Uh, I know of a case where um, the husband died. Both husband and wife had a lot of co medical complications. But after the husband died, within a few days, the wife decided that, realized that she was no longer able to run the home by herself. So she made a decision to, much as she hated to, this is a dream home where they wanted to live till the end of their lives. She had to sell her house and move into a independent living facility because she felt that was best for her. And we agreed that was the right decision for her, right? And then ethical issues and end-of-life care are critical aspects for geriatricians. There are a lot of these issues that we need to worry about. Rita G is now going to take over and drive this bus home. So, help me question. Yep. I think part of the years is we need to add some realities of the life. Mm -hmm. For example, like uh, we live in a uh, lot of assumptions that we are not going to die, and most of us plan everything. That, that's one thing. Second thing is we overly depend or assume that our kids will take care of us. I think one up to a few generations back it was true. But what our love, I'm not challenging, like, you know, we raise our kids with a lot of love and affection, but expecting is not going to be like to happen. And uh, that, that's not a reality, especially the, with the current generations. Yeah. So your, your topic fits right in gyro diversity with, change, with, with changing circumstances. It's the ecological context. It's a social environment. All of those will, and you're absolutely right, will define what realistic expectations are, what can be done, what cannot be done. Um, I'll just make it a, one quick point in answer to that, uh, which is, happens a lot in the Bay Area. We come here, we get good jobs. I'm at Apple, my wife is in Cisco, and we have this great house, we have these two kids, and we have a fabulous life ahead of us. And we have this guilt in our minds churning because our parent in Hyderabad, parent somewhere else, right, is all alone. What should we do? Pack our bags, leave our jobs, go back and look after them? I don't think we want to do that. So what we do, we pull them, force them out of their comfort zone, out of the comfortable environments they lived in, bring them here, say, all is well, we are here, we are all together as a family. We leave at six in the morning, drive to our work, come back at eight at night. Rita Ji talked about this, parents are alone, isolated at home, suffering. So a lot of these different things happen and we have to consider all of those holistically. Did you? As always, so great to hear from uh, Mukunji because he's got so much, um, uh, you know, clarity of thought. So um, I just thought that the other thing I also want to say that as part of this skill building, the the uh, ethos of this class is also to be able to draw upon your own creativity. I think just today, while we were in that break room, I talked to two wonderful people in the audience and they have figured out some ways of dealing with this. So I think that uh, to your point that uh, we are in a very different demographic and I'll just share this one point since you raised this, when we were attending the 2002 Assembly on Aging in Madrid in Spain, um, I remember uh, one of the topics not only was the fact that 
suddenly people realize that, oh my God, the world has changed. We are now going to have more 65 year olds, more older adults and lesser younger. In fact, that's the way it's going because birth rates have gone down and many people choose not, not even to have children and so on. But everybody has a parent, remember. You all have parents. But I think that at that point, they also said that, how are we gonna take care of them? And I think this point that the gentleman who just walked out said, what's gonna happen? And I think given the fact that mobility, given the fact that extra education, I mean, in the past people lived in small places and they never left. But now because of migration, because of you know, socioeconomic uh, goals and others and nuclear families everywhere, it's a whole, there was a whole panel which lasted for days that it's going to be a different world out there and who's going to take care of us. So I think when you and I reach our 80s, we're going to have the same conversation. But I think the point about uh, geriatrics, which you so amply said, uh, Mukund, that you know, geriatrics, gerontology, gerodiversity, whatever you look at, nobody wants to age. And I think this is something that I have realized in my 30 years of career in this field that People just don't want to talk about aging. So I remember this professor who told me, Rita, I'm happy to talk to you, but you know what? I'm not your patient because I'm not old. And he's 92. So, you know, it's, it's, I understand. Nobody wants to think about aging. It is not cool to age. So if you think about that, that's the reason why there are such few geriatricians today. Nobody's going into this field because it's the most poorly reimbursed. Also, what's happening is there aren't too many specialists, um, I'm sorry, uh, too many specialists that are in this field. And, and it is a crisis-driven field. Why do I say that? People don't plan. So all these things we talked about, you know, the wonderful things about brain health and mind and body and all of that, very few people think about it. They are racing in life. You're working, you're handling so many things. You don't think about it. And all of a sudden you're retired. And as one person said that, typically when it comes to our medical notice is when a, one parent passes away. One parent passes away, everything falls apart. The other parent now needs looking after, the whole infrastructure is gone. What do you do about mechanics? Who takes care of them? Who takes them to the doctor? Who does the long-term planning? Sometimes it falls on one adult child's burden, so on and so forth. So the field is crisis-driven, unlike other fields, and that's the reason why there's so much of chaos in geriatrics. So what I typically do is when we sit down and do a consult with anybody, whether it's an adult child like you or an older adult, we talk about, uh, certain things, we talk about a big picture and we talk about safety first thing. And safety can mean many things. Is the house safe? And that's the first question I ask. Do you know, because many people will not go through uh, any safety in the bathroom, which where the falls occur, you know, everything is fine. I did what I could for my child, but I, nothing is important for me. Coordinating care, that becomes a huge issue. Okay, so you go to visit your parent, they need to have a doctor's appointment, they need physical therapy, they need good food, they need all these networks, who's gonna coordinate the care? If you're not there, if they are not capable of doing it, who will do it? We don't have people in the community, and when you're young, it's different, when you're older, it's different. The daily life challenges, what is your daily life like? When people hit retirement, there's so much of economic data right now coming out. The minute you hit retirement, there's almost a plummet. People lose self-esteem, people lose so many things. Not everybody is as engaging and as brilliant as uh, you know, Mukunji, who has created a, you know, a separate life again. Many people, and I see this because I'm very honored to be working with a lot of professors who have taught me, they find that suddenly life loses meaning. What is meaning? So you need to prepare for that. I mean, I have started preparing for myself. I think I've overdone it ever since I was in my 20s that what am I going to do when I reach a certain age because I should not be the one that loses everything or loses interest in everything. Then your diet, your hygiene, memory and mobility. And I think one big point that uh, Mukunji just made is prevention. So I'll give you a small story and maybe you will use this to um, do something for yourself or maybe a patient or when you're advocating. I come from a family where there's severe osteoporosis. My mother passed away after a fall. My sister had a really severe bone condition. So when I came here, the first thing I told the doctor is, 
I come from a family with osteoporosis. I already have osteopenia in my early 20s when I came here. So they started me on this regime of vitamin D and calcium and bone strengthening and checkups and all of that. Till today that I find that I've really compensated and I've done well. Why did I do that? Because I knew there was a problem. So if there's a problem, you can correlate it to that. If you know you're an only child, if you know that you have parents that are beginning to age, if you know that people around you need it, you start to be proactive, you start to work now. So I think those kind of principles have helped me because, I mean, again, to share something personal, I saw my parents pass away when I was very young. My husband's an only child. His parents have lived with us for 30 years. And my mother-in-law passed away with breast cancer. My father-in-law lives with us. He's completely 24-hour assist. So I've kind of, I work it, but I also live it. So I realized that if you're positive and proactive and preventive, there are ways you could, you could get around this. Okay, so what are some of the things you need to learn about to either be an advocate or be a, you know, if you want to start a entity on this particular topic or whatever it is, um, learning about what are activities of daily living, instrumental activities of daily living. These are some technical terms that a doctor or a clinical setting will use, which is when you look at somebody, you will see what are your activities of daily living and what are your instrumental activities of daily living. So I'll give an example. So let's say you talk about your father who lives in Bangalore or Hyderabad. Um, is your father able to dress, bathe, go to the bathroom, take care of all of that? That's one thing. Is he able to do the IADS, which is making his own appointments, getting his own prescription, going to the grocery store, coordinating the bank balance. Those are important to do. Okay, next one is, what are the insurance coverage? Money becomes the most important piece. I mean, I think what Mukunji just said that the, the first question I get asked is, you know, I'm connected to this huge international network where people will ask you a question as to what do I do? It's about who will take care of my mother or my father? You need to hire help. It's exorbitant. In this country, it's anywhere from $28 to $35 an hour. And so, but I find that people are not properly educated on what their insurance will actually pay. What are some of the community resources that you can actually have? And that's a lecture by itself. So always important to find that out. Not only here, I'm not sure there are too many community resources in India, but things are actually building setting up a network of care. What do I mean by that? Next time you go talk to your parent, take them to a doctor's appointment, convince them to let you go. Convince them that mom and dad, you're important to me. You did this for me, let me do this for you. Learn about their diagnostics, learn about their medications, and then say, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to set up a network of care, which is every time you go to the doctor, you will take X, Y, and Z. You can empower them. You can pay them. You can help them. But you create a network of care so that when something really happens, you have that set up done. The next is housing and, of course, legal, financial. These are things we do a lot, especially when somebody has dementia. I don't know if you are aware of this, but the minute you are diagnosis of dementia and it's on your medical record, you lose the capacity to actually sign an advanced directive or make too many financial decisions. There are lots of legal aspects to it, driving and all of that. Okay. Um, the other thing which I've, uh, uh, yeah, I'll come back to. So the next one is hospital systems. Um, many people, and I think the gentleman who was here talked about the fact that, you know, who's going to be taking care of us. Uh, most of us don't know what the hospital system is like. It's like a crisis. And having spent close to 25 years in a hospital setting, it can be chaotic. So to realize what it does and you know, being, being able to understand that is important. Of course, I think you talked about hospice and palliative care, family meetings. So I conduct a lot of family meetings in which what I try to do is I try to get the family together and I say, a crisis is going to happen sooner or later. Let's be, let's be prepared for it. Which adult child is actually gonna step up and do this? Who has the time? Who has the resources? Who has the finances? And many people will not agree because family dynamics are complex. Oops. As you know, each family is different. Finding that common ground. If you can get somebody to actually talk about finding common ground because these are your parents, they gave you life, they gave you love to be able to come together. Um, financial issues always can drive a family apart. And, but also people just don't see eye to eye with each other. 
Those of you who live in this country know about advanced directives. I think most of you have them. I've had situations where I'll be standing outside the emergency room. There's a, there's a crisis. The father has actually said, I do not want to be resuscitated. I do not want to be intubated. There's an adult child that's there. Somebody and another adult child walks in from Minnesota, Mississippi, somewhere and says, no, cannot do that. We have to get him through this. Guess what? The medical system will listen to you. You know, at that time, things can be chaotic. So having those conversations are very important. And hospice and palliative care, we are very much new. People still are not comfortable in talking about. They're com not comfortable talking about aging, leave alone death and dying. So we are very far from that conversation, but we are getting there. Family and adult children, uh, Mukunji had said that caregivers, I'll tell you, to me, um, as someone that deals with the caregiver constantly, with caregivers, myself being a caregiver, I realized that even though it's my husband's father who lives with us, I'm the one that's doing the maximum juggling. Now, adult children like us, we all have our own you know, issues. We are juggling our spouse, our children, our relationships, our money, our work, and who will undertake this whole bulk of coordinating? Coordinating care is not easy. It is not easy. I mean, you take an example that Mukunji said about going to a hospital. I'll give you a simple example of this patient that I'm working with right now. A simple fall in the backyard caused a hip fracture that caused them to go to a skilled nursing facility. While coming back, they need some caregiver. They don't really have the money. So they need to figure out a plan as to who's going to come and help them. Half the time, there's no food in the house who's going to bring the medications, who's going to help with mobility. There are multiple pieces. It, it really takes a village. And you see the whole society is geared towards youth. It's geared towards active vitality. So aging kind of gets pushed away. Now, ideally, in my life, I would have hoped that we would have social systems whereby if there is a reason, if there is a problem, people will arise to the occasion. You know, why not have like a Red Cross for older care where somebody reaches out and says, you know, I'll do this. It's actually quite scientific. I mean, those of us who have done this, it's, it's, it follows a pattern. You have to give the maximum attention when there's chronic illness and then set it up, set it up, set it up. It's, it's not bad. And I think we've been able to do a lot of safety education that prevent a fall. And that itself is a big education. Health system changes. Again, when you go into a hospital, it's chaotic. Um, you must understand the disease difference between acute illness and chronic illness. So most of America and most of the world actually is not dealing so much with acute illness, which is like a sudden heart attack or a cancer related problem or a stroke, but it or a fall but it is chronic illness, how to manage that day-to-day -day, uh, you know, obesity problems or arthritis or diabetes or heart, heart disease and, or uh, hypertension. And then something which is uh, very common here is this whole handoff. Uh, so when you, when you do this, so imagine an adult child, imagine one of you, male or female, who now has to work and take care of their children and handle other issues plus be available for your father or the mother who then is now in a hospital, then goes to a rehab facility. So there are multiple pieces to this. And I believe that people have asked me that if we don't have the money to set it up, how do we do it? That's where these proactive meetings come up. That's where these planning details come up where adult children can sit down or family members or communities to say, how can we help each other together? I think one of you just made a comment about, you know, living in a community where everybody helps each other. Um, you know, talking about this is an important matter. You can always find somebody to help you babysit. How many times do we talk about the other pieces? So these are some of the proactive planning areas that I teach about where you can, if you can create these buckets, not only for your parents, but even for yourself, making sure you have all these health, safety, housing, care, legal, financial resources, insurance, and community. And I think it's uh, really, really important to start early so you kind of have your own plan. A lot of us are now talking about uh, aging in place, which means the house we live in, we want to continue to live there. Do you have that set up? You know, do you, as you get older, most people do not want to go to facilities. They want to live there. Do a financial check. Think of the number of years your parents have lived or you are going to live and calculate, 
calculate and see, do you have the money to live? Put aside some money for care. Buy long-term insurance. Sometimes that really helps. You can afford it when you're healthy. You cannot afford it when you're ill. The caregiver, anyone can become a caregiver in a fraction of a minute. You can be a perfectly happy-go-lucky person. All of a sudden, parent calls or a spouse calls and you become a caregiver. Caregiver occurs across all settings, hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, and ultimately end of life. Now remember, this is the area of research that I'm actually working on right now. We are publishing on this. So think of me as the caregiver. I am helping my father-in-law every day, taking care of him. Now, as he changes, I also change because my burden gets heavy. My life gets complicated. I may also have problems. So all this while, we only thought about the patient. We never thought about the caregiver. But the caregiver is also, as Mukunji said, aging is moving on that transition path. That trajectory is help affecting us also. And many people, many caregivers will have an acute incident, research shows, before the parent will, because of the stress. We are managing too many things, okay? Um, the caregiver stress. So sometimes what I do is when I work with an adult child, I let them understand, you know, like that weighing scale, what is good in your uh, in the scale? What are the wonderful things that are happening? What are the negative things that are happening? How do you balance it? To be able to give, you have to receive, right? So how do you receive that? Whether it's through meditation, through whether it's through happiness in some other way, but just also what we are talking about resilience. Do you have that resilience within you to do that? You cannot be feeling you know, upset and angry and then try to provide nurturance and care. It somehow doesn't work like that. And sometimes you just can't do it. I mean, you have to be realistic and say, you know, this is not something that I can do. Uh, learning about your community and other networks. And this is probably the last slide. So what I, when I do a talk, and most of the times it's adult children, I talk about first find out who you are, learn about yourself, figure out your negatives and your positives and what are your goals. Try to express them. What is my goal? What else do I want to do in life? Are you task focused? Are you emotion focused? Are you avoidance focused? There are some people I know who will never think about that last, you know, I don't know what's gonna happen in the future. They don't wanna talk about it. So you could be in any of these categories. You figure it out yourself, figure out that kind of activity for yourself. Engage in preventive factors, imbibe successful aging. Everything that Mukunji has taught you today, everything that we learned about health, you know, mindfulness, learning about life, you know, you can't stop aging, right? Just because it's not cool, you're not gonna stop aging. You are gonna age. Ask questions, family meetings, common ground, and seek help. Uh, I'm gonna end with one thing which I did not include in my slide, but you know, one of the books that I'm writing, it's, a, it's, an, it's sort of a, a group of uh, interviews that I did when I first came to Stanford. I interviewed a lot of my professors who were there and now that time in their 50s, 60s, and 70s, and some have passed, and now they're in their 80s and 90s. And I asked them a question about uh, what would you do in the future and so on. And I went back and I interviewed some more of them and most of them, when I asked them, what would you have done different? Do you have any regrets? Practically all of them said, I wish I had talked to my family about aging. I wish I had included them in this process. I wish I had had a much more community you know, approach towards this because you can't do it alone. You really need societal. So I'm hoping that you know, through Sukham and through other entities, not only are we doing all these wonderful things with data and uh, you know, you know, artificial intelligence and, and the Silicon Valley, what it is, but we are also creating the infrastructure to age gracefully. I'll end with that. So, uh... We've got, we've dealt with a rather serious subject here, right, today? Um, lots to think about, lots to digest, lots to reflect. One of the key things about aging, though, is in order to age well, this is my personal philosophy, you have to have a sense of humor. Right? you have to be able to laugh at yourself. If you can develop the ability to laugh at yourself, 
right? Then the whole world looks different to you. Do you remember I started with a poem this morning? Right? What is the subject? Hair. Hair. Right? Hair. So let me tell you uh, when we'll go to Q&A, but before that, let me tell you another thing about hair. So a friend of mine tells me, you know, I've observed this and it's true. Men who get bald in front think they're thinkers. He says, okay. Then he said, men who get bald in the back are sexy. <laughs> so, ah. so then I said, so for people like me, who are both bald in front and back, we think we're sexy. <laughs> right? I think I'm sexy. I'm bald front and back, so maybe I think I'm sexy. Right? So I think we, if we are able to make fun of ourselves, we'll be in a good place most of the time in our lives. Right? So don't forget, although we're going to be talking about serious things, although we're going to be dealing with distress when we go out and help people, uh, never lose the frame of reference of joy. So if you can ground yourself in the frame of reference of joy, if you can <clears throat> radiate goodwill, radiate happiness, if you can uh, help to heal rather than, you know, sow seeds of dis discontent, you do, most of the things you do get that much easier. They're not going to get really easy. You, you go through some tough times, but it gets easy, right? So with that construct, starting with hair, ending with hair, uh, we've covered the full spectrum of aging in a nutshell in three lectures. Um, when Krishnaji, I guess he left the room, when he comes back, he'll talk to you about um, the homework and so on. And fact of life, folks, homework still exists, right? Uh, it's 19 past four now. Uh, we have some 20 minutes or so left for Q&A. And so, well, I don't think right now uh, uh, Rita ji is not involved in that. I had a discussion with Kailash ji about it actually earlier. And if you wouldn't mind uh, holding that thought, Kailash ji is still recovering from a serious uh, acute illness that he had. I think we are all fortunate that it, it was really bad. Uh, thinking that he went through for a few days, but he's back on his feet, he's back home, he's out of home care and getting strength. And so, within a week, we'll address that. Um, again, I think we want to discuss the Omdala projects in the construct of the, the whole Omdala. Uh, Rita ji is not involved in the Omdala project, so. I think it's better while she's here, if you don't mind, that we talk about uh, where we can draw on, on the resources. So both online and in the, in the room, we open it for questions. If you don't have any questions, we'll just move on. Uh, Krishnaji will start the next part of the show. Uh, but I, before we get too far, I do want to thank Rita Ji again for coming today to uh, uh, help with, with, with this uh, series. Uh, you notice that all our slides are branded with Sukham. So you'll see a few more Sukham groups go through here. Sukham and HCI have a strong uh, partnership together. And we'll be teaching courses on palliative and hospice care. She talked about advanced care planning. We'll do a two hour lecture on advanced care planning, um, medical care. For, uh, for people over 50, those kinds of things. Um, so you'll see more of Sukham. 
but um, are there questions that we can address now? That that is my that is our philosophy absolutely yes. Just just one second. Can people online hear the question being asked in the room? No. Okay. So the question being asked here by Savita Ji is uh, that she feels that one of the nuggets that she has got from the from the class is that in order to be to to be helpful in the aging construct, right? we have to understand our own aging process. Is that an accurate summary? So, so the summary question is not only is it a uh, summary of the question is or comment, I should say more than a question is not only is, is it important for us to focus on our own aging, but there's a need for the, to, to generate uh, the discussion and awareness in the community so that the community builds there's this critical mass in the community so that we can focus on this. And, yes. Yeah. Agree. So, so my response to this is, you're absolutely 100% correct. We are doing the best we can to spread awareness. So come and HCI. The pro the reason we're doing all of this is because we see the need that you see. We and that is why we're we, uh, we are spending our time and effort. Uh, in, 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 in building this course and building this community of act activists, if you will. Um, one of the objectives, do you remember the last objective of my first lecture? Healthy aging, it said become, an, um, become a community ambassador. So I'm hoping that when we leave this course, those of you in the room here, those of you in online, will be sold enough on this concept that we will have 30 more people going into the community to talk about healthy aging, to talk about the crisis in caregiving, to talk about the need of being proactive, as, as uh, uh, Rita Ji says, in taking care, uh, understanding what is likely to come in the future in your own immediate friend and family circle in terms of caregiving issues and being prepared for it. So I, I fully subscribe to what you're saying. Avoid so much of the caregiving issues because preparation is so much the battle. You know, it's just, it's just not caregiving, it's not, it's not aging. You talk about education, clean water, environment, this, that. Everything has to be, everything has to be, everything in society that's important for the betterment of society has to be a community effort. There has to be broad community consensus. There has to be broad community activism, ground roots stuff before things are going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions online? Uh, are there anything being recorded, Krishnaji? Um, any online questions? Any other comments? Yes, Prabhuji. Sure. Um, I'd just like to honor and acknowledge what you do. Um, just to say that you have been with us for would, would you mind so that the people online can hear? Can you come here and talk? Um, okay. So that I don't need to. The microphone's in, 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 in the PC, so yeah, this is good. Okay. Um, I just want to acknowledge Rita G. Um, just understanding Stanford and aging, and it's just a very t challenging and a crisis-oriented 
they kind of gave us an overview, but it gets really difficult um, when it actually happens, as we've heard a lot of people on our strings saying that there were, um, you know, deaths and happening in the family. There's the community not coming together, and we don't quite have that yet, and it's taken some time. But in honoring Rita G, um, I just like to say that there's not that many people out there that can show us as a role model to our community that has confidentiality, respect for each person, and as we go through this process alone without communities. And I think we can learn a great deal from her, as well as you. Unfortunately, I haven't worked with you, but uh, I hear so much of wisdom. But I can't thank Rita G enough, and I think she's going to be an, an excellent resource for all of us, especially when the term aging comes up, that we can go to her and actually break it down. Being an advocate and fighting for us individually is what she's great at, and she makes such an impact. I mean, she was the pillar at Stanford when it came to aging. It, there was no joke. No, everybody stood down to her from the doctors to neurologists to everybody. I mean, this woman just powers through and will stand by you day in and day out, whether you call her at two o'clock in the morning or like, you know, on a daily basis, she'll be there. And that's what I would see us as, as, you know, what Kalash G and everybody else, but amazing, generous person. Thank you. Well, all I can say is we are proud to, I am proud and honored to have her as a friend, as a Sikkim volunteer, and uh, for her to be here teaching today. Uh, you reminded me of something I brought with me. Which, uh, uh, Rita G has probably not seen in a while. And I guess the camera here is going to see it too. Sounds familiar? Looks familiar? Uh, this is one of the booklets that Rita G created uh, when she set up the Aging Adult Services at Stanford. And uh, it provides a high level overview of what Aging Adult Services at Stanford does. Right? And it's signed by the director of the services, Dr. Rita Katak. So it's here. And I, I'm at Stanford several times a week. And Every now and then I bump into somebody that says, oh, I knew Rita well. <laughs> Questions, thoughts, comments? If not, I think uh, we can move on to the next session, but that requires Krishnaji to be here because it's his... Uh, if we can go find him. Say that again, please. Any help or support for the caregivers? The, there is actually a whole series of courses available on exactly that topic. And uh, I don't know if we have that in the syllabus for the course now, for this year, but that's definitely something that uh, um, we can consider in the future if it's not there. Uh, you, you can... There are several courses on, um, I think there is something on compassion for caregivers and so on that will come later on, but you can have courses on a, 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 sort of a, a one-on-one for caregiving, but also self-care is huge. Self-compassion is huge. So you could probably do uh, an HCI style course for three weeks mm -hmm. on caregiving. So we'll distill something that for you, sure. Thank you for that input. Um, with that, I'll hand the floor back to the boss. And the boss, I'm just a helper here, okay. <laughs> uh, thank you, Rita Ji. She has to get back to the Thank you so much. Okay, uh, thank you, Mukunji, and uh, thank you, Rita Ji, for, uh, for coming and uh, 
for your help in today's class and we appreciate your um, presence here okay uh, now coming to the hard part <laughs> see that's that's what he said boss nobody likes me now okay <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, so we have three sessions today and each session has, uh, I don't want to say a homework, it's self-exploration self and just put it that, put that whatever, like, you know, yeah, we, we land out of this one. So I, I don't need to read the questions, okay, the three are here, okay, so they're already on the Moodle, okay, so we have the, car. pardon? No, 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 no. That's why I put the AZ, each subject, AZ 100. Yeah. So, 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 so Mukhenji is very practical. So that's why he didn't give multiple questions. And also he is so kind that he linked it to 200 words. Max, he put, okay. So it's not actually like, you know, if you see, these are not uh, huge work. And um, I mean, I read the slides. I think it will be very good to read. It will be helpful for us, like, you know, rather than uh, homework. More than the homework, it's like kind of read, go through the slides, just a self-reflection of what you need. That's what he's asking, basically, for, our, for ourselves, for the people in the HCI and the, in the communities. That's what overall, like, and how, yeah. I guess the, the point of each question for each of those is this material is going to be useful for you for sure. Exactly. Talk about how it's going to be useful. For, for the people around us, okay. So so I think that's, that's that is, it's not an exercise, basically it's just self-reflection of what they taught today and how we are going to use it for ourselves and how we are going to use it for the people around us. So, and uh, the thing is like, you know, we, like standard, you have two weeks to submit and uh, we will start grading. Hopefully, within uh, four weeks, we will be done. And uh, yeah, I think that's it. Like, and if you have any other questions. So, uh, let me tell you one thing about. Uh, Mukunji, you can come here so that uh, they can ask me. Let me tell you one thing about uh, homework assignments. Uh, ha having been a professor for years, right? <laughs> um, if you think homework assignments are bad for the students, Think of the poor professor who actually actually read the stuff. I, I know you have no heart for the poor professor, but speaking for the poor professor from experience, right? Um, it's it's non-trivial effort to go through every answer and provide feedback that is useful, that is helpful, right? And we are not trying to add work for you. We're trying to help you derive value from, from this. So, so on the same uh, lines, I want to share my experience. Like, and I'm working, volunteering for Yoga Bharati and I'm also training the yoga teachers. Then they have to write some assignments on the Moodle. We are using the Moodle there also. So the experience is uh, when we ask to write certain things, really, really they're opening up and writing their self-reflection. Sometimes it's a learning process for, I mean, that, the positive side for the professor or like you know, the teacher you suddenly like you know start learning from the people's experience because our experience are limited because it's only within our limited vision like in limited range but when other people are writing on the same topic they bring in their own experiences and it's like so refreshing sometimes sometimes it will open up your blind spots like you know you're always don't get a chance to see those things even though they're around you all the time so it's like not only you are doing for your for sake like you know for the great purpose but you're also letting others also to learn out of your experience like by writing 200 words yeah uh, yeah before mukunji comes i will tell one thing uh, we will, he will tell, but the only thing is confidentiality. That's one of the reasons. Uh, I don't know what is the, what is the criteria for that uh, in order to keep the confidentiality because. Yeah. So uh, you, you are exactly on the right lines. We, this whole serve, learn, serve model is, is learn, serve, learn model is to benefit us as a group, right? Um, and again, as Krishnaji said, we have to deal with 
ethics, privacy, confidentiality, and so on and so forth. So my goal is for the assignments that I give, as you know, I'm also in the process now setting up Ananda Core on the site. We want to be able to take some of these answers and so on and put it into a repository that all of us can, can learn from. And so it's, the sharing will happen, but it'll happen in a sort of a delayed mode. And as you go into the practical aspects of community service, you will reap the benefits from the answers that each of you have given. And by the way, the answer, as you said, as you said, Krishnaji, we are constantly learning from our students. That's a lifelong, long learning process, right? And we, we will make that happen. But we have to get everyone's permission first. The reason we have not done it already is we have to get to the point where we have to ask the group as a whole, are you okay with our sharing? We'll go through that process and get there. Okay. So with that, I think uh, we, we are like a little bit ahead because Mukund is always so, very efficient. Can, can I tell you another joke? <laughs> Please. Yeah. Yeah. We have, we have, we have, we have at least 10 more minutes. Floor is open for you. Yeah. So you'd rather hear a joke from me than leave 10 minutes early. Boy, that's commitment. So, as I said, I, I was a professor for donkey's years. And I thought I did this course, a semester long course. Uh, this was actually a laboratory course. Um, and I felt very proud of myself. I'd done a fabulous job, right? So um, then I'm giving the final exam and I'm sitting there in the hall proctoring the exam, open book, open notes, people are sitting there writing. Then this young lady, um, about 10, 15 minutes to go, to, gets up. She brings her answer book. You know, I'm sitting down, so I, I look up and she's there standing above me, looking down at me. And she's folded her answer book in, in half like this, right? And she holds it in her hand and pounds it on the table as she says the thing. Professor, she says, this is absolutely the worst course I've ever taken in my life. And she puts the answer book there and walks out of the room. Right? You know, I'm in various stages of this discomfort here. She got an A in the course. She did one of the best uh, uh, jobs on the course. Story ends there for a while. Now fast forward four years. I'm now sitting in my office and there's a knock on the door. And I look up, second time I'm looking up and there she is standing at the door, looking down at me. And she says, do you remember me? I said, how could I ever forget you? <laughs> she said, I had to come back to tell you that it's only after having gone and worked for three or four years that I realized how much you taught me, how much your course is beneficial to me. So in, in, in the, in the uh, that's one of the best grades I got, by the way as a professor, that didn't yeah. change. But the grade was like yeah. four years of stress. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd never know when something you learn is going to help you. You can also take the attitude, and I, I will stop after this one. Uh, you, you, you heard, I was, I was surprised when Rita Ji talked about entropy and thermodynamics in a, cor in a course in aging. Uh, I taught thermodynamics, right? Oh, Jane Fonda, not, not today. Someone in this room talked about entropy and therm Jane Fonda did, right? Um, you see, I'm getting... <laughs> so the first day I'm teaching, uh, first week of classes of, for my junior level thermodynamics course, I have office hours, student walks into the room. He says, Professor, he says, please tell me what I have to do to get a C in your course. 
first of all, dumb question to ask a professor, right? Second, you realize what the expect intent of the student is, right? So if you come into this course asking, what do I need to do to get a C? You don't belong here, really. You know? right? I I didn't tell him that, but but it, it depends on the intent, you know, the, the way you approach them. So anyway, enough of storytelling. That, that's fine. Next we, we enjoy the we enjoy your work all the time. Okay. Okay. So we are coming to the end of the session. Uh, we will uh, unless anyone have any questions. Rajaji, you want to talk about the home dollars or anything? Oh. Hope everyone. Yeah. Okay. So, any other questions uh, online? Anyone have any questions? Okay. 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 Let's uh, st uh, close the session. Uh, sit, everyone, uh, with your feet on the ground. Op roll the shoulders. Open the chest. Close your eyes. Observe your breath. Bring your both hands to the heart center, pressing the palms against each other gently. Take a deep inhale. Chant. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kaschit Dukkha Bhag Bhave Om Shanti 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 Rub your both palms to generate some warm. Then to place the palm palms on your eyelids. And massage your forehead, your face, cheeks, your neck, back of the neck. Bring your both hands in open book in front of the eyes. Look into that. Blink open your eyes. Thank you. Thanks for coming for Thank today's you. session. Thank you. Thank you, Mukunji, again. Okay, bye everyone online. <laughs>